Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for 2023. The first item of, uh, on the agenda is consideration of whether to take an items five and six in private. Item five is the consideration of evidence. We will hear under agenda item uh, two, and item six is consideration of our work programme. Are we agreed to take these items in private? We are agreed. So our next item of business is uh, an evidence session with the Scottish Government to discuss priorities following the change of First Minister and associated reshuffle earlier this year. This made things more interesting or perhaps more complicated for the committee in that instead of scrutinising the work of one Cabinet Minister, we now find ourselves scrutinising the work of three. We heard from the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Net Zero, and the Just Transition in June, and we heard for the Cabinet Secretary for the Wellbeing, Economy, Fair Work and Energy last week. This week, we will begin by hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands, Mari Goujon. I welcome you, Cabinet Secretary, uh, and I'm pleased to also welcome from the Scottish Government, George Burgess, the Director for Agriculture and Rural Economy, and David Signorini, Interim Director of Environment and Forestry. Uh, the evidence session will take place now in the run-up and the pre preparations for the Scottish Government's budget for 2023 and 2024, as well as confirmation earlier uh, this month there is to be a new land reform bill. Cabinet Secretary, I believe you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm really pleased to be here with the committee today to outline my priorities in relation to land reform as well as the environmental matters within my remit. Now, as we've set out in the new programme for government, it makes it clear that responding to the climate and the nature crises will remain at the very heart of the government's approach going forward. And it is the existential threat of our times, and we're seeing the devastating impacts it's already having, particularly on the world's poorest with increasing frequency. So we don't underestimate what this change means for daily life, particularly during these particularly uh, tough times. And so ensuring that our approach is fair and it actively tackles inequalities through a just transition is a key element of our planning. However, I think if, we, if it is managed well, addressing, mitigating and adapting to climate change and protecting and restoring nature will also bring us huge benefits. These are major challenges, but they will also create opportunities. As highlighted in the PFG, caring for Scotland's peatlands is a critical element of our approach to tackling the linked climate and nature emergencies. Our new peatland programme will deliver an increasingly integrated and evidence-led approach to peatland restoration, management and protection. And to this end, the government has committed £250 million over 10 years to restoring 250,000 hectares of degraded peatlands by 2030. This will complement the work that we're already taking to address the concentration and transparency of land ownership and to support more communities into land ownership through a new land reform bill. The bill stems from work done by the Scottish Land Commission, which was established under the 2016 Land Reform Act and the consult consultation that we undertook last year. Year. It will build on existing land reform measures such as the register of persons holding a controlled interest in land and complement existing community right to buy mechanisms to ensure that Scottish, uh, Scottish communities derive greater benefits from Scotland's land. The Scottish Government will help rural communities to take advantage of these opportunities to become more sustainable, productive and prosperous through supporting those good green jobs in the rural economy. And this investment will also play a critical part in Scotland's just transition to net zero by 2045. So I look forward to our discussion today and happy to take any questions from the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And before we go any further, I'd like to remind the committee and the Cabinet Secretary of my register of interest, where it clearly shows that I'm a member of a family farming partnership and own land in Murray. Uh, so uh, now that that's on the record, I'd just like to clarify before we go into questions from uh, Ash will be the first question. At when we were discussing uh, land reform uh, prior to the reshuffle, it fell within Murray McAllen's portfolio. Can you just confirm to me that everything to do with land reform now falls purely within 
your portfolio, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, that's right. Land reform, taking forward the future land reform bill, that falls within my portfolio. Obviously, there are cross-cutting interests between the different portfolios, but land reform falls to me. So, I mean, peatlands may fall <laughs> within uh, Murray McCallan's uh, portfolio, but the, the land reform side of it, if there is land reform on peatlands, will fall within your portfolio. Yeah, and just to clarify as well that peatlands also falls within my portfolio too. Gosh, well, it's terribly confusing, but I'm glad we've got that on the record. I can look back and make sure I get it right in the future. Ash, you're going to have the first questions. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. So um, I want to start by asking you about land reform. Obviously, it's around about 20 years now since we've had the community right to buy. But only 3% of Scotland is in community ownership. So I'm interested to know, you know, is the Scottish Government happy with that level? Would you consider that the policy has been successful? I think it's important to remember that land reform is a journey and I think you're absolutely right that in terms of it being 20 years since essentially that was first commenced but I think that we are intent on taking that further which is why we will be bringing forward another land reform bill this year as we'd previously committed to because we want to see more of a diversity in terms of land ownership in Scotland we want to see more community ownership I think that's one thing that came out of one of the previous reports that had been done by the Scottish Land Commission was really about how in Scotland it's at the moment it's seen as well the right to buy for communities is seen as a, a means to an end when it should be something that is considered normal in Scotland and something that we should be proactively encouraging communities to do and that communities themselves should proactively be looking at so I think as ever there's almost more work to do but I think the land reform bill that we'll be introducing will take us a step further on that journey. Mm -hmm. So would you be able to outline what you would see as perhaps the key barriers um, as they stand at the moment and whether you think that the legislation that's upcoming would it would it be sort of making those barriers easier for communities to get past is that something you're considering of course we want to try and remove those barriers that can prevent communities from considering ownership and ultimately to make that as a straightforward a process uh, obviously we have to make sure that there are checks and balances in place there uh, so ensuring that we get that balance is critical but i think that we can learn the lessons from previous pieces of legislation that have been passed before identify where any of those challenges might have been and what might uh, prevent communities from considering ownership as an option and I do think that we are seeing a, posi a positive trajectory when it comes to that when you look at community ownership in Scotland a report that was done in 2021 it had shown that there had been uh, over a seven percent increase in the amount of assets that are owned by the community just on the previous year and I know that through the Scottish Land Fund, they're also seeing quite a good pipeline of projects coming through. So I think the appetite is there. Uh, we are seeing that clear appetite from communities. Things are heading in the right direction. But I hope that through mm -hmm. the land reform bill that we'll introduce, we'll continue to see that positive trajectory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the issues that we're noticing with it is there does seem to be quite a lot of geographical disparity. I'm sure you will have noticed that yourself. I'm wondering if you have an idea what the reasons behind that might be. So, for instance, we know that there's no community ownership at all in Falkirk and less than a handful in places like um, Aberdeen, Angus, which will have be interest to you, I'm sure, uh, Dundee and East Dumbartonshire and also Renfrewshire. So does the government have um, some actions in mind that they are looking at to take to address this? I think in relation to that, obviously, we want to see a broad diversity and to ensure that every part of Scotland, uh, we are seeing you know, community ownership and communities taking ownership of whether that's land or whether that's buildings and, and other assets too. So again, I, I reference the community ownership in Scotland report from 2021. And also within that, I think it highlighted that where we saw the greatest increases in community ownership were in Highlands and Argyll and Butte. But as you rightly identify, Falkirk is an area where there haven't been any uh, community, uh, where there isn't any community ownership of assets. So I think it is something we need to tease out, try and get to the bottom of what any potential issues might be there. 
But it's also important to remember that there are a number of things that, that have to align when it comes into, uh, when we look at community ownership. You need to ensure that you know, there's the relevant uh, well, community bodies that are in place, uh, the right motivations are there, it has to be the right piece of land or the right asset. Maybe those pieces haven't quite aligned, but again, I think we need to tease out what any potential barriers might be and look to see how we can address that. But I think it's, it's how these projects come together, that overall motivation and making sure everything that is aligned. Um, but it's also important to highlight too that in terms of any decisions that are made, all of that is, is publicly available through the Registers of Scotland website as well, so that uh, if anybody wanted to look at that information or to see the various reasons why uh, things didn't go ahead, they can find that information there. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you, uh, Ash, for those. Monica, you've got some questions. Um, yes, thank you. Sticking with community right to buy. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if you can help to explain why there is a lower approval rate for late applications, which I think is around 42%, in comparison to Timmy's ones at 73%, and whether the additional requirements for communities making late applications are proportionate and necessary. Well, I think in relation to the late applications, that was a key part of the legislation, and I think a really important part of the legislation that was introduced. And I think coming back to one of my previous responses, where I talk about ensuring that we are getting the, the balance there too, I think that that is what that legislation tried to strike by giving communities the opportunity in exceptional circumstances to uh, register... Uh, to take forward or look for a transfer of land after the point of sale or transfer. But I think that there are a couple of key checks and balances within that. First of all, to ensure that from the landowner's perspective that the community, there has been an interest there in terms of the community, in terms of what they want to do with the land, but also from the community's perspective that a landowner isn't just seen to sell or transfer the land before the community have had a chance to register or express an interest. I believe that the balance that's set out there is correct, but of course, if the committee hears any evidence to the contrary or this is a matter they're considering, I'd be happy to take any further information from them in relation to that. Um, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, just some of the um, points that I've been reading about, just some of the extra requirements in terms of um, a significantly greater level of support at registration stage, which is um, higher than expected 10% normally required. So it just seems that there are additional sort of burdens there and whether that's fair or not. I don't know if, if you've got any sort of feeling on that. Yeah, it is a fair point. There are additional barriers there, but I think particularly because of the points that I've raised there, and that's really what these extra steps are there to try and balance and address. But again, if the committee is hearing evidence that, that contradicts that or the balance isn't quite right, then I'd be keen to get the, the information on that. But I do think it's important that we have these protections there, both for the, whether it's the community as well as as for the, the landowner too. Um, so currently I feel that that balance is correct and we have the right steps in place there. Um, but again, more than happy to consider any other information. No, that's great. Thank you. And what action has the government taken to respond to the Land Commission's 2018 recommendations on community ownership? And what expe expectations does government have of the Community Land Leadership Group? I think it would probably be fair to say we haven't as made as much progress against the outcomes in that report as what we would have liked to do, because I think when that report was first introduced in 2018, the key focus at that time was on implementing the 2016 Land Reform Act. And then, of course, after that, we had the pandemic, which quite rightly was a complete shift in focus for the Scottish Government as a whole. But I would say that there has been progress against some of the recommendations that were set out in that report. One key area, though, I would like to take forward, uh, and I will follow up with the Scottish Land Commission on to see how we can progress the, uh, the recommendations that are set out, is in relation to the vision for community ownership. I think that was a really important outcome from that report, so I'd be keen that we progress that. But in relation to the, the first recommendation, uh, where we've now published NPF 4, which references some of the, the policy outcomes there, 
in re relation to the second recommendation, which talks about indicators and different uh, measurements and how we ass really assess and monitor that progress. We have addressed that through the national outcomes as well, where we now uh, monitor the number of assets, not just the scale of what's been transferred, but also the number of assets that are in community ownership as well. I also think that there's scope there for us to address some of the other recommendations that came out of that report through the review of the, the Community Empowerment Act from 2015 as well. So the review of that act is ongoing at the moment because it's also key to remember that the various rights to buy and community asset transfer, all those rights don't just fall to land reform legislation, but to uh, the Community Empowerment Act, which is a responsibility of the, the Community Wealth Minister as well. So I think that it's ensuring that these different vehicles we've got, we can try and address these recommendations. But there are certainly areas where I want to address more progress. And sorry, could you raise your second question as well? Um, I think you've covered most of it. It was again just the expectations on the Community Land Leadership Group and just what action government has taken on the 2018 recommendations. Yeah, the Community Land Leadership Group had their first meeting in May of this year, so it's still at a very early stage at the moment where they're really setting their, their terms of re reference. But I do think that that will be a positive forum really for sharing some of those challenges, those ideas, looking at op any opportunities that exist going forward. Uh, their minutes are published online too, and I think that they will be looking at some of the key issues that we know uh, communities face going forward. So I think that will be a really critical, import, uh, an important part of that work going forward and how we assess and monitor our progress and, again, some of the challenges communities are up against. So, as I say, that works in its early stages, but I think that will be important uh, as we move forward. That's great. And just um, lastly, because I think, Cabinet Secretary, you anticipated what my, my final question might be. Um, you mentioned community wealth and... I'm interested to find out how government is working, I suppose, behind the scenes to make sure there is that cross-portfolio approach. So in terms of land reform and, and your aspirations, um, what work is going on with other ministers to make sure that in terms of just transition, community wealth building legislation, that there is that alignment? How does that work in practice? Mm -hmm. I think it probably comes back to the point that the convener raised at the start of the meeting as well. I think, unfortunately, when it comes to some of these policy areas, they don't fit neatly in boxes. Um, but we do work collaboratively across government to try and address these issues, which are clearly cross-cutting. And that's the case right across my portfolio. But, you know, We talked about peatlands environment, biodiversity earlier. Community wealth building is exactly the same. As I say, there are community rights through the Community Empowerment Act, so there is that strong link there with the work that we take forward in land reform. So I do have that engagement with the Minister for Community Wealth, and I'll obviously be engaging in the work he's taking forward through that legislation um, when that comes forward, as well as through the review of the, the Community Empowerment Act too, because I think it is really important. We can't work in silos, and we need to make sure that we have that join up. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, Douglas, did you want to come in? Yeah, come in um, Cabinet Secretary, there's, to date there's been three applications to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, none of which were approved. And there was one application to, to buy land to further sustainable development, which is currently under consideration. So this doesn't seem to be working, does it? Well, I think it's one area. I think when you look at those applications in particular, so this was, I, I think this actually, um, even though it was part of the 2003 legislation came into force in 2018, so we've only had a few years there. I think, but it's important to look at those different applications, and of course everyone is assessed on its own merits. But I think even though the three applications that had been put forward hadn't ultimately been successful through that uh, through that piece of legislation. It was for a variety of different reasons. So in uh, two of those applications, the landowner was periodically doing work to the land, so then it couldn't fall into that classification of being neglected or abandoned. And in the other case, there was, in the end, uh, a negotiated transfer of the land, which was then facilitated and funded through the Scottish Land Fund. So I think even though it didn't go through that process, there was still that mechanism there. And I think ultimately that's where we would like to be when it comes to you know, land tra transfers or land acquisition. It's done through negotiation and agreement. So in terms of one of those, that's how that was done there. So do we need to change the criteria to make it more attractive and to actually encourage more of these to take place? Again, I, th I think it's something that would warrant a closer look at to see, well, what are the barriers there? Are there criteria that, I, again, would potentially need to be considered? But I think that I, I don't think it has been, we'll obviously see with the application that's there at the moment uh, where that gets to, but I think that 
given that one of those was ultimately still successful, I think that's a positive step. But again, it's just something we have to continue to monitor. So you mentioned barriers there, and something that Ash Regan asked earlier. You know, what are the barriers, and what work have you done to assess what the barriers are that is meaning that these aren't coming forward? I mean, in, in, if you're talking specifically in relation to the abandoned, neglected and no, detrimental we'll land... We'll go wider than that, then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think particularly in relation to that one, as I say, it's not as straightforward as, uh, as it can be made out in terms of the applications, purely because the land ended up not falling into those categories in a couple of those examples. But, of course, whatever the, there are challenges or issues, we want to try to get to the bottom of that. Um, and, again, I think that's where we have the Community Land Leadership Group that can help us try and look at some of the issues that exist there. We know, for an example, right now, that cost of living pressures and the inflationary costs that people are seeing can be a barrier for, for progressing uh, with transfers or, or acquisitions. So, again, that's, that's why the funding and the support that we provide through the Scottish Land Fund is really critical in trying to address that too. But I don't know if officials would have any further information or George would have anything to add to that. In relation to this abandoned and, and neglected areas, I think if you think of, think of it from the perspective of the community group, you, there is often a, a reason why the land has been abandoned or neglected and community groups might actually be quite reticent about jumping in. So I think that maybe lies behind why we've had a few examples at the moment. There is detailed guidance uh, on the criteria that ministers will use when identifying uh, whether, whether land is, is abandoned or, or neglected. We can, of course, look at, at, at that again, but I think we've got relatively little evidence at, at the moment to, to, to work from. But you know, with you know, some of the community groups out there, we can seek to identify whether there is a, you know, an, an untapped pool of community interest that you know, there is something that is, that is blocking that. I suspect probably not a great deal mm -hmm. at the moment. But has the, has the government, <coughs> government done detailed work to see what the barriers are around community ownership? Because you, know, you mentioned cost of living crisis. <coughs> what else is there? You know, there must be other reasons why people aren't coming forward, whether that's lack of help from local authorities, whether that's maybe too much risk that they perceive. So you know, what, I'm trying to understand what the barriers is, are. I think, actually, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier, the evidence from the Scottish Land Fund is that there is a good pipeline of projects coming forward to them from communities. So there doesn't seem to be, for, for that aspect, a, a significant lack of, lack of demand. It's perhaps more around the abandoned, neglected land and the you know, furthering of sustainable development that we have seen a, a, a rather smaller number coming through. So I think that, through you know, the Community Land Leadership Group, further discussions there uh, with, you know, with the sort of community ownership support service um, to get more of that sort of grassroots feel mm. for, for what the issues are. And I also think that the review of the Community Empowerment Act will potentially flesh some of that out as well. I'm sure that we would all have examples within our own constituencies or regions about uh, where those, where, when it comes to community asset transfer, where that process hasn't quite worked out for a variety of different reasons. So I think it's important that that review is undertaken so that we can see how on the whole that process is working and if there are any lessons to be learned from that too. So we'll, when will we see that review back? Sorry, can we, when will we see that review coming back? Will the criteria change for some of these schemes? Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to outline that purely because it's being led by the Minister for Community Wealth, but I'd be happy to follow that up with colleagues and uh, provide that written advice to the committee. OK, thank you, Convener. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, Cabinet Secretary, before we move on uh, from uh, community right to buy, obviously once a community has purchased uh, the land, the, the next thing is to, to make sure that it's viable. Um, could you just confirm that all the community right to buy or uh, have ended up being able to stand on their own two feet with their assets? And if not, how much does it cost the government uh, to fund them on an annual basis to allow them to do so? I don't have that information to hand, but I, or I don't know if George would have any information on that. But again, I'd be happy to follow up and, and give that to the committee. OK, be, I think it would be helpful. I think uh, experience tells me that sometimes looking after large tracts of land with, with minimal assets actually costs money rather than generates money. Um, so I think it would be very helpful to know, mm -hmm. you know, it's fine promoting the community right to buy, which I do, um, if the community is group wants to do it. 
but it's how we fund them going forward which I think is relevant. But I also think that's where you know, we talked about the different steps that are in place before that can be registered, how that moves forward and ensuring we have all these checks in place is really important to ensure that as far as possible this is done in a sustainable way. But again, I'm, I'll look into that and provide that information to the committee. And, and I absolutely understand the, the principle of putting management plans forward and, and how often management plans don't uh, always... Uh, follow through exactly as they've been planned. But it would be very helpful uh, from, the, from uh, the committee's point of view, especially with land reform coming up. I'm going to move now to the Deputy Convener, uh, Ben McPherson. Ben. Th thank you, Convener. And just before I ask my questions on, on community asset transfers, I just want to say that the heart of New Haven in my constituency uh, has been a tremendous success and a good example of uh, a community asset transfer happening in an urban area. Uh, likewise, Belfield in Ash Reagan's constituency, uh, I know, has been a successful um, project. So, um, moving on to some questions about land markets, uh, Cabinet Secretary and, and your officials, welcome. Um, first of all, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the Lands Commission's recently published uh, Land Market Insights report and any thoughts you have on the findings of it. Absolutely. I think just to pick up on your first point as well, I don't know where Granton falls, whether that's in your constituency or in, uh, or in Ash Reagan's, uh, in fact, but, uh, it's in your, but just to say that I'd uh, undertaken a visit there in May, and I think that that was, again, great to see in an urban area what you can do through the Scottish Land Fund and just how important these, these uh, transfers of land can be for community groups. But in relation to the, the Market Insights report, we obviously welcome that work that's been undertaken uh, by the Land Commission. And the, the, their findings were based on a number of, uh, uh, it was based on desk-based analysis as well as interviews with a number of land agents as well as uh, valuers as well. So, obviously, it highlights that there is the number of transactions in that year has been very low. If the findings that I think it was that the price of timber had largely impacted land values before, but I think it was really interesting to see the impact of the changes to the Woodland Carbon Code and how they were seen to have had a, a cooling effect on the land market from that perspective too. So I think it's really valuable for us to, to take these insights and to see where any interventions we can take as a say through the, uh, such as the changes to Woodland Carbon Code, can have an impact. Th thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and I appreciate that uh, responsibility for nature, Scott, um, does not lie with, with yourself and the, the public-private finance pilot, but do you believe that private investment <clears throat> in ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration uh, is necessary? Uh, and what impact do you think that this is having on Scotland's land market and, and could potentially have going forward? And related to that, uh, is there a risk that two parts of government could be acting against each other and their each other's stated uh, objectives with public money for carbon sequestration, inflating land prices and limiting the opportunity, therefore, to be bold and radical in diversifying patterns of land ownership? There's a lot in that, so if I do forget a point, please come back to me and, and remind me. In relation to the Nature Scott pilot in particular and the, the, the need for private investment in carbon sequestration, I do think it's necessary that we have private investment. I don't think that we can reach our climate targets or do what we need to do in relation to uh, addressing the biodiversity crises that we're in as well without that, that private investment. We've recognised that within our national strategy for economic transformation, but it's also been recognised globally too through the global biodiversity framework, which had been agreed at COP15, which recognises just how important private finance is, because I think with all the, the public money and resource we have available, I don't think we would be able to, I think just the sheer scale of investment investment that's needed, we can't do that through the, the public purse alone. But what is really critical then is if we recognise the need for private investment is ensuring that that is what we've set out and what we want to achieve, that is values-led, um, that it's based on specific principles um, that we feel are important to us in Scotland. I think that there is that community involvement as well, so it's ensuring that we have all that in place. So I think the Nature Scott pilot offers a valuable opportunity to really look at that and ensure that we are having that uh, values-led uh, 
integrity-based uh, system of private investment in Scotland. I don't see that in particular having an issue on, say, land values, because those, that pilot project in and of itself is about working with existing landowners and seeing um, how they can make that work together. Uh, but of course, it is a pilot, so we'll be monitoring that closely and making sure that we take any learning from that as we go. Um, and it's happening in two, two parts of Scotland uh, in particular. So I think it is really important that we, that we monitor that. And as I said in my previous response about the Woodland Carbon Code as well, I think that we can see how we can make some interventions that can have an impact through the, uh, the extra additionality that we introduced through that code. And then it's interesting seeing that follow through through the, the Market Insights report too. Um, so I do think that investment on the whole is important, but we need to make sure we manage it correctly and do that in a fair and a transparent way that also involves communities, because I think that that can be an issue. Uh, we need to make sure our communities feel part of that process and that they actually see the benefits from that, that private investment as well. Um, I think I got a note of your other point about does that contradict other areas of policy? I think was that the, if the point that you were raising? I don't see it, our policies being contradictory. If anything, I see them as being complementary with each other. We have the interim principles for responsible investment in land. We have our land rights and responsibility statement as well. I think all of which set out that we need to see diverse ownership. Um, we need to see more community ownership in Scotland. So I think that our, our values are, are very much aligned in, these, in this regard. And I don't see any contradiction in policy in terms of what we've set out. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I think within that, there's there's a pertinent point that to invest in land and, and um, measures, whether it's with regard to biodiversity or carbon reduction, the investor doesn't necessarily need to own the land. It can mm -hmm. be in agreement with with the landowner, and, and, and through that consideration, seems to be where you you see we were able to undertake a process of land reform where we diversify who owns land, but also uh, advance those necessary investments and bring that private finance into the, the shared aspirations Absolutely. of biodiversity and carbon reduction. Um, one last question, if I may, Convener. Um, you touched on it earlier, uh, Cabinet Secretary, around um, the, the considerations around land value and, and if there's anything more you, you want to add around how a more diverse pattern of land ownership uh, will be realised through a, 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 a situation where the reality is that there are increases in, in land value. Uh, so any thoughts on that as a, as a generic point, uh, further thoughts would be helpful. But also you touched earlier on granting in my constituency, which was an example of where uh, working with central government, local government was able to acquire land in order to um, have the necessary flexibility and, and, and ownership of the asset in order to deliver public and social housing. And thank you for your answer in the Chamber last week on these points, because as we consider the Land Reform Bill, while a lot of the focus will be on rural Scotland, actually the pertinence of land reform in urban Scotland when we face you know, an increasingly challenging uh, housing situation uh, with demand for housing and a uh, cost of housing being a real challenge for many families. I, I, I don't know if you wanted to comment more widely on the, the urban considerations. Uh, absolutely. No, I think that's a really important point. And I think that's uh, why that was recognised in the changes that had been implemented to the Scottish Land Fund as well back in, in 2016, because yeah. up until that point, it had just been mainly uh, rural uh, considerations, but recognising that, of course, in urban areas as well, there are still critical issues there too. Too. Um, so it is a, a really important point. I'm um, coming back to the point that you made about the increasing land values and the, I suppose, the impact that that has and our ability, I suppose, to support communities in, uh, with increasing uh, land prices. Obviously, our main mechanism for that funding support is the is the Scottish Land Fund, and. It, 
So we have we've increased the funding to that this year to eleven pounds with the overall aim of doubling the land fund to twenty million pounds by twenty twenty six because we want to ensure that we are assisting as many communities as possible. And while we want to make sure that we are funding as many different community ownership projects as we can and we want to make sure we are seeing that spread in terms of projects. I think that we have seen through other transfers, um, and it of course depends on individual applications, that there we have you know, funded projects to quite a significant extent through the Land Fund as well. So I think we do have that important mechanism there. But I, I think that is where also other fundraising uh, efforts are important. Um, we have seen that in other cases too, where whether that is community fundraising, there is uh, you know, private donors have had a, a hand to play in that as well. It is also about the other support that we can provide. We also fund the community ownership um, support service too, um, to help with that advice and assistance. So I think it's ensuring that we are really maximising the advice, guidance and the funding uh, opportunities that we have. And it is uh, just a situation that we are going to have to continue to monitor closely so that we are enabling communities as, as far as possible to have those opportunities uh, for ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Convener. Uh, just before we move on to the next question, there were some uh, suggestions uh, well, we'd written to you, I think, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary on the land commissioners and the appointment, and Andrew Thin as chairman is stepping down. Um, and we'd asked why you'd chosen to extend him for uh, three months in post. Uh, it either suggested that you'd started the recruitment too late or there was a problem with it. Could you highlight what, what that extension? And the reason for that is, please. No problem. And I understand I've still to formally reply to the committee as well, but it was really to ensure that we had that, that continuity <coughs> through the appointments process and as we're looking to appoint new commissioners to the role as well. I'm sorry, I'm completely confused. So I understand you want continuity, but if you want continuity, you, you, you actually you recruit before the, terms, the person's time is up rather than just extending it? Well, through that period of change, I think that continuity is important rather than having whole-scale change uh, of the Commission. Sorry, George, where you want to come in? I think, fair to say, we did start in good time on this process, but uh, the interaction between Government and the Committee on the appropriate involvement of the Committee and the process has taken a little bit longer than, than we had expected. So that has set back our, our timescale by, by a as a small amount, and therefore the, the Cabinet Secretary has agreed. Mr. George, that, that's, quite actually a, that's quite a comment to make, and I will check up whether the committee actually was reticent in delaying its response. I don't believe it was, uh, um, and I certainly don't believe that I, I'm going to accept that. So could, I'm going to could, part that because I think this is a conversation that I'm happy to take with the Cabinet Secretary offline. But I think it's like important to, to clarify. Could, could, I don't think George was saying it's the committee's fault that no. that process was late. It's because we've, had, we've been following a new process with the ethical yeah. standards. Commissioner as well. So I think it's been getting to grips with that new process. So by no means blaming the committee at all, but I think that's I'm happy to follow up with the convener afterwards, but I just wanted I, to clarify. I think that it point. would be best to at this stage. So I'm going to go straight on to uh, Jackie Dunbar who's got some questions. Jackie. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my questions today is round about access. Um, many folk during post, uh, well, during COVID and post COVID, found or rediscovered our outdoor spaces and our gorgeous countryside. Um, with that in mind, Cabinet Secretary, do you think that the current outdoor access code is sufficient in detail and directive to cope with a large increase in access levels? You know, what do you think needs to be done to, map, to manage these challenges that increased visitor numbers have created, especially around popular spots? I think as much as it is a challenge, I think it is also something to be welcomed to a certain extent, the fact that we see more people enjoying our outdoor spaces. And I think that's exactly what we would hope to see. But mm -hmm. it is it's that... Uh, that responsible access, which is absolutely key. Now, I know that in relation to the outdoor access code, that was an issue that was debated extensively when the legislation was first passed. And I do think it's hugely important that we retain the, the, those rights to, to free access. But that's where I think that it's the education, it's the guidance that's available around that 
which is really important. I know that Nature Scott has been working with the National Access Forum in relation to that, that education, that guidance, and looking at campaigns in that regard. Um, but I do think there is no getting around the fact there have been very particular issues. So, as a result of that work in 2020, there were uh, visitor management groups that had been established. We would also created a visitor management strategy, well, developed that, and then looked to implement that as well to try and manage manage those hotspots where they arise. And alongside that as well, we've also had the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund to try and help where there can be you know, particular issues uh, with uh, infrastructure in certain areas. So I think we've undertaken a number of measures in that regard to try and alleviate some of the pressures that are seen. But uh, on the whole, I, I, don't, I just don't think that we can let the behaviour of an irresponsible few really harm the access rights for the, the vast majority who do enjoy that responsible access of our, our countryside. But, you know, there's no getting around it. It is a difficult thing to manage. But I th do think that these are vitally important rights that, that we need to retain. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you as someone who visits the Highlands regularly. Um, and I think education is the key. But the sad fact is that there is a small amount of folk that just do not abide by the rules and will behave irresponsibly when they're out and about. So do you think that the current bylaws are appropriate and proportionate to manage this behaviour? Or, or do you have another solution? <laughs> I, I'd be interested to hear the committee's thoughts on that as well, actually. I mean, I do think that it's... I think the, the bylaws are an important mechanism because I do think where we do have these particular areas, whether it's irresponsible behaviour or even just in terms of public safety, these mm -hmm. are, you know, risks that we have, to, we have to try and manage. But we do know that there have been successful campaigns in other areas that, you know, where there haven't been the use of bylaws. And I think a good example of that is the Like It Be campaign that's been run by Care Gorms, because that is a really difficult thing to manage. You know, as I was saying earlier, that free access with also trying to protect what is a hugely important species for us in Scotland, the Capper Cayley. And that was work that was done with ecologists and, and various other groups as well. And I think that that has been shown to be successful. But I do think it's also right that the national parks have the mechanism for a bylaw uh, or to introduce bylaws where they think that's necessary and to enable that. I mean, enforcement is only ever a very last resort mm -hmm. in relation to that, but I do think it's an important mechanism that they have. So I think that there's just recently been that review in Loch Lomond and, and Trossex about the bylaws there because they've seen an increase <laughs> in incidents at the Loch with greater numbers of people going outdoors uh, and, you know, just some of the really tragic incidents that we've heard about that have happened there too. So I think I think it's important that they're able to take measures to try and address that where they can for public safety, but enabling that enjoyment and that access to the outdoors as well. So yeah, I do think we have the right balance in enabling that, but again, more than happy to take the thoughts of the committee on that and, and hear their views. Okay. Thank you. Convener. Thank you. Uh, we've got some questions to have from Mark Ruskell. Mark. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to turn to Crown State Scotland and their role on climate change. So, you know, we're obviously developing a new climate change plan at the moment. It's going to need innovation, new policies coming forward. What, what do you see as CS's role in that, in that space? Are they, are they feeding into that plan? Where do you see the opportunities going forward for CS within their role to really, you know, help us to take the action to meet the ambition that's in the mm -hmm. law? I think they've got an important role in a number of ways. I think, first of all, in terms of all our, uh, our, our public agencies and Crown Estate Scotland in particular, I think there are opportunities there to, to lead by example. Um, and I know that for the, when it comes to the, the Scottish Crown Estate in particular, they have their own climate change action plan. Um, and I th they're also part of an environment and economy leaders group. So that involves the, the chief executives of all the, the main public bodies, as well as their sponsoring divisions within the Scottish Government, ensuring that there is that collaboration across the piece on climate change, uh, adapting to that as well, and ensuring that they they are feeding into that to the broader uh, policy objectives there too. So I think that it's, it's really critical that they are part of that work and they do directly uh, feed into that work as well. But I think in terms of their future work too, uh, their commissioning work to look at adaptation, what that might look like for this state, uh, also looking at you know forestry, peatland, what they can do with the, with the assets that they have as well. So I do see them as a, a critical yeah. part of the work that, that we take forward on yeah. climate change. Do you think there's enough innovation there? So I'm thinking in particular about the marine environment. And I noticed that I think they're doing some work looking at whether blue carbon 
is you know is an acceptable uh, you know way to see private investment come in or not. Um, you know, obviously we've got you know marine energy technologies as well. Need for kind of innovation around that. Are you, are you comfortable that CES are already sort of pushing into these spaces, trying to make sense of it, trying to think of appropriate ways forward, or is there is there kind of more to do? Uh, again, I think probably we can't say that everybody's doing enough because I think there, there is always more to do. I think, mm. especially when it comes to climate change and the nature crises as well. Now, this is slightly off topic, but it just reminds me of you know when you look at land reform there too, and I talk about you know crime estate leading by example. So, with the Scottish Land Commission, they're taking forward a community land acce accelerator pilot as well. So, I think it shows how they can, uh, they have the opportunity to act in that space to really try and make a difference. To to ultimately achieve all of our, our shared objectives mm -hmm. as well. So I think there is always more that can be done, but I think that they are, they are in a particularly unique position given the land that they own, the marine assets, the built assets that they have as well to take a lead in, in, in each of these areas. Yeah, yeah. And then on, on the other crisis, the, the biodiversity nature crisis, you know, we've now got the strategic framework and delivery plan. Do, do you see there are, there are key opportunities there um, and I guess I would particularly highlight, you know, aquaculture. We're still seeing widespread community concern about the growth of aquaculture in Scotland. There is a view that it is not being appropriately regulated, and there are criticisms of CES and others in that space. So, uh, given that challenge, given other challenges and opportunities, do you think CES could and should be doing more to deliver our? biodiversity strategy. Again, there's a lot to unpick yeah, in, in each <laughs> element of that as well. Um, having done a separate aquaculture session, I think that mm. th there is a lot of work going on in that space at the moment. And I think just to address that point in particular, we published our vision for sustainable aquaculture over the summer. Um, I, and I think you'll see as part of that, that you know we put that enhanced emphasis on climate and on the environment as well as on community benefit as well because we want to see that we're seeing uh, ensure that we're seeing more of that uh, benefit come to communities across Scotland who, who host uh, aquaculture but there are also a, a number of key commitments in that as well about going beyond the regula uh, regulatory limits when it comes to waste discharge as an example about how we can collect that waste use that as part of our, our circular economy uh, and better utilize um, uh, waste as well. So I think that there are a number of new commitments within that. Um, and also, it's also important to recognise, first of all, the innovation and technology that's going on in the sector at the moment as well, to try and address some of the key challenges uh, that they face. Um, and also in relation to regulation. Now, I wouldn't necessarily agree there isn't enough regulation, but I think that there are a number of bodies involved in the regulation of aquaculture. We know we need to make improvements in that regard, and that's where the work that we're taking forward uh, on the back of the Griggs Review is really important. We have the Scottish Aquaculture Council, and a key thread of that work at the moment is in relation to consenting. So we have a consenting task force there. It's not about less regulation, it's about more efficient and more transparent regulation of the industry too, and how we can make that work more effectively with all the key bodies involved and we're hoping to take forward uh, a pilot of that very soon and to see what improvements can be made to that system so again there's there is a whole host a body of work going on in that space but again coming back to Crown, Crown Estate Scotland and their role in biodiversity they do have a really key role to, to play in that as well and I think the, I get, when I talked about in the climate change space they're part of the environment and economy leadership group they're also part of the Scottish biodiversity program as well which is about engaging with the stakeholders Holders, mm. uh, exactly looking at the biodiversity strategy. They're also starting to embed that in the work that they're taking forward with their own farming tenants. Uh, we're seeing that through the work that they do. They have an environmental grant scheme as well, where it is about biodiversity, um, getting rid of invasive non-native species, um, and all sorts of different things in relation to biodiversity there too. So again, there's always more that can be done, but I do think they are doing a lot mm. of work in that space, and that will continue as we look forward to the, the biodiversity okay. strategy and delivery mm. plan. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I think earlier on, in response to Convener, you, you clarified what your role is in relation to, to peatland restoration. I mean, obviously, a you know a shared priority across government with different ministers feeding in. But can you can you sort of comment then on why peatland restoration has been so 
so difficult to achieve at the scale that we need it to achieve if we're to tackle climate emergency? I mean, what, 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 it, what, is, the, what is the problem here? What can be done to increase that rate of of restoration. Yeah, we do know that more needs to be done to accelerate the rates of peatland restoration that we're seeing, but there are a number of challenges in relation to that. Um, first of all, there's uh, only a short season for that work taking place. It's the skills capacity. Uh, I think there had been challenges in the past about that overall future commitment for funding, but of course we have the 10-year the funding commitment of £250 million in relation to that as well. So there are a number of different factors at play, but we are are taking action to try and address what are the key bottlenecks. So Nature Scott is leading on a, a peatland skills uh, action plan. We have a delivery improvement plan as well, identifying what those key challenges are and the actions that we're taking to try and mitigate and uh, address them too. But I would also want to highlight that and maybe end my response on a bit of a positive because we are still, even though the rates aren't what we would like to see and we know we need to go further uh, and do more of that, we are seeing that trajectory heading in the right direction. So our target this year and that we'd set out in the PFG was to restore 10,700 hectares. Now that's a 40% increase on the restoration rates that we saw over the course of this last year, which saw 7,500 hectares restored. But even that 7,500 hectares was 35% of an increase on the previous year. Right. So I think that even though we're not where we need to be, the trajectory is strong and we're taking action to try and address the challenges that we know exist mm. because we know we need to do more. Mm. Do you think there's a role for private sector natural capital investment in this space? Because obviously the focus so far has been on woodlands, but in terms of peatlands? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, we also have the, the peatland code there as well, but I think that there, there have been issues with that that they're looking at addressing too in terms of the validation of projects um, through that as well. So I do think, uh, as I said in a previous response, that private investment is essential going forward in, in these key areas. It's how we manage that and ensure that it's an integrity-based uh, and values-led market that we have in relation to that as well. Because, but again, we know what the issues are. We're doing what we can to, to try and address them and ensure that we are seeing the restoration rates increase. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, uh, Mark. Just some questions, if I may, on islands, uh, which also fall within your portfolio. The circular economy bill has been published and will produce some challenges, I suspect, if implemented as it stands for islands and how they cope with the requirements of the bill. Can I ask how you fed into that process and what you see the key challenges are? I Again, I suppose like anything, there, where there are challenges, there are also opportunities for that. And I think we see that with the work that we're doing with climate change in Ireland. So they'll be at the, the forefront of the climate change impacts that we see. But I think that they also have the capabilities to, to deal with that. Um, and I, I do see the same with the circular economy as well. So as part of the work that's been taken forward with the circular economy bill, there's been an Ireland's community impact assessment, which shows that there are expected to be benefits for businesses in islands. We're trying to support that work already, whether that's through the islands programme and the funding that we produce through that. I was visiting Shetland to announce the, the projects that we denounced funding for uh, just earlier this year, and one of them was a project in particular that looks at the, the circular economy there and how we can improve that. So, again, there's no getting around it. There probably will be issues, but it's important that our islands feature in that work as we go forward. A part of that bill is about having a circular economy strategy. So I know that there will be that engagement with island local authorities going forward. They, they have to be a critical part of that process because I think they can also bring forward quite a lot of the solutions to what we're trying to achieve too. And just, just out of interest for people who are watching in, can you confirm that the impact assessment has been published and that you have highlighted within that what changes might be needed to the island's plan? I know it's been undertaken. I presume it's been published, but I can double check that for you. Yep. Uh, I think it would be useful and we'll, we will flag up where that is uh, if we can find it easily. No problem. Um, the other question just on that is, is that um, the decarbonisation of islands, which you, you briefly mentioned, might, might prove problematical in some respects. Um, can you say where you think those problems might be um, when they try to keep pace with everything that's going on off-islands? 
Yeah, there is, and there is an awful lot going on uh, at the moment in relation to decarbonisation, but I think the Carbon Neutral Islands project is a really key part of that. We published an update to where we are in the project in January of this year, but it's obviously moved on since then. So we're working across six islands. The carbon audits had been undertaken. The climate change action plans had been published just at the start of the summer this year. The next stage in that process is in relation to the investment strategies and how we then build on the actions that are set out in those reports. So I'd be happy to keep the, uh, the committee updated on that work because it, of course, will feed into other parts of government. As I say, that islands will be facing the impacts of climate change they'll be at the <coughs> forefront of that but I do think they also hold a lot of the solutions to climate change too so I think there will be critical learning uh, within that process that can be shared but uh, there are also I mean when I look to the other parts of my portfolio too they will also have uh, an impact on islands and how they uh, adapt to climate change and how we can help them adapt to climate change to, you know, to just talking about peatlands there, whether that's uh, forestry, also in relation to agriculture reform, which, you know, be uh, bringing forward the bill in relation to that, all of that will have an impact. So it's ensuring that we are, of course, as ever, working with our islands and trying to identify the solutions as we look to implement these changes. So, so the bottom line is, will the things we've just discussed, the two issues we've just discussed, cause a, a change to the island's plan? And will there be additions to the island's plan well, there's um, currently as a result of it? Uh, well, it's important to remember, I mean, obviously so much has changed and so much has happened since the last islands plan was brought forward. So we're undertaking a review of the islands plan at the moment. Um, there are a number of uh, consultation events in relation to that too, to ensure that the strategic objectives that we've set out, so 13 strategic objectives there, we want to make sure that those objectives are still the same, if they're relevant, if there are other areas that we need to look at or put more of a focus on. So I think that the review is going to be really critical in identifying what any other potential areas might be. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, fairly full session. I'm just looking around to make sure that I haven't missed any member who wants to come in with a uh, further question. Uh, I think that's it, uh, therefore. So what we're now going to do is briefly suspend the meeting. But before I do so, just remind you that we'll be writing the Scottish Government with our pre-budgetary observations later in uh, the autumn. So uh, I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting.
Welcome back. Uh, we're now going to hear from the Minister for Transport on the Scottish Government's transport policy, uh, sorry, transport priorities for the transport policy. That's quite a, uh, a mix-up of words. Uh, as with our last session, this is going to be a wide-ranging session uh, with an eye on the Scottish Government's next budget and future recommendations that, as a committee, we might make on that. I'd like to welcome Fiona Hislop, the Minister for Transport from the Scottish Government. Nice to see you at the opposite end of the uh, committee rather than sitting next to me, as that will be a new experience for us both. Alison Irvin, the Interim Chief Executive for, for Transport Scotland. Bill Reevy, the Director of Rail Transport Scotland. And Chris Wilcott, the Head of Ferries Branch for Transport Scotland. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and as I say, we are pleased to welcome you back. Um, I think you want to make a brief brief opening statement, Minister. Yes, Convener, and it will be brief. Uh, good morning, Committee, and it's good to see the familiar faces uh, from my time as Deputy Convener of the Committee, and also to uh, recognise and acknowledge the two new members um, of the Committee. Uh, so I'm pleased to make my first appearance at this Committee as a Minister, following my appointment uh, to the new role in June. Uh, a fortnight ago, the First Minister presented the 2023-24 programme for Government uh, to Parliament, and our trans the transport package represents uh, a clear focus on the First Minister's priorities of equality, opportunity and community, and builds on our previous record of delivery for all of Scotland. We are making our transport system more accessible. We know that good public transport is a key economic enabler and provides opportunities in training, education and employment. We recently laid regulations to enable the bus uh, franchising and partnership options of the Transport Scotland Act. Uh, these will come into force on the 4th of December and will allow transport authorities to begin developing their preferred options for improving their local bus services. Uh, we intend to bring forward further regulations before the end of this year to begin giving these powers full effect. Other regulations are also planned in relation to pavement parking, road works, uh, zero emission vehicles, and we're also expecting a number of UK SIs to come before this committee. Uh, starting in October, we are undertaking a six-month pilot that removes ScotRail peak time fares. Uh, the pilot will make rail travel more affordable and accessible during this period and will help to identify longer-term steps to reduce car use. Uh, to support our island communities who rely on our ferry services, we have frozen fares on the Clyde and Hebrides and Northern Isles routes and will continue the construction of six major vessels. And the fares fare review will report by the end of this year. The review will recommend a package of measures and actions for the future of public transport in Scotland. And we're continuing to improve our infrastructure. Uh, progression of the A9 duelling continues as a priority for this government as the First Minister's announcement of a new procurement of the duelling of the A9 between Tomat and Tomoy demonstrates. It will also reopen open the railway line to Levenmouth, including new stations at Cameron Bridge and Leven. Uh, this month, I confirmed funding of £140 million that will see the delivery of the East Colbride Enhancement Project and the uh, Barhead Route Electrification Improvement Works remain on track for completion in December, and we plan to publish a refreshed rail services decarbonisation action plan. So measures such as these demonstrate our determination to make our transport system ever more accessible, reliable, and to reduce the impact we have on the environment and climate. So I look forward to working with the committee now as a minister and to hopefully build a constructive relationship as I account for Scottish Government policy in action but importantly, where I can receive advice and recommendations from this committee. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I think we clarified last week who was in charge of what aspects of the ferries. I think you're in charge of, of, of the actual making them work rather than the purchase or uh, the management of 801 and 802 till they come into service. So I'm happy with that. Just when it comes to major road uh, and transport infrastructure, um, there seems to be a separation of responsibility. I think that the transport uh, and road infrastructure falls to you, but the uh, uh, active travel and cycling infrastructure falls to Mr. Harvey. Um, how will you take that into account? How do you work together on delivering that, especially, say, on the A9, small bit of A9 duelling that's now uh, out for tender? 
So the, you've heard from the Cabinet Secretary for, for Transport, Net Zero and, and Just Transition. She leads on major infrastructure in terms of the strategic decisions and, importantly, the budget decisions that will need to be made ac across the piece, as you could expect. Um, in terms of the cross portfolio uh, working, clearly active travel is really integrated to a lot of our work. Um, on in relation to rail, I can give you a couple of examples. More recently, uh, we opened the Stirling, the, the you know the um, the refurbished Stirling station, and that was very much aligned with active travel and including also accessibility for bus, but particularly for more active travel, cycling, etc. The same for Motherwell. Um, at the Motherwell station, the rail station that was opened, you referred to the A9 um, area, and in terms of that, I know um, there's interest in uh, how we can ha ensure that there's um, safe routes around the A9 in particular areas, and I know a number of MSPs have contacted me, including John Swinney, about some of those issues about cycle lanes uh, alongside the A9. So in terms of how we work together, we obviously need to always look for opportunities um, to make sure that we can connect uh, between active travel and rail. And, and I think that's the big vision uh, in terms of how we can change Scotland in terms of activity. If we can link active travel, bus and rail connectivity more, which I think everybody wants to see, the challenge is how do you actually deliver it and where and when and the priorities. That, I think, is the big picture. So I hope can be that gives you an aspect that we do and will work very closely together. Uh, thank you, Minister. That was easy questions. Now the difficult questions come from Mark. Uh, Mark Ruskell. Well, thanks, Kavir. Um, well, I want to start by asking you, Minister, about the pilot project to remove peak rail fares um, and really about preparedness for that. So have there been any challenges that have been identified up front by, by Scott Rail Transport Scotland and um, how those are being addressed as we as we move towards the 2nd of October? So, uh, clearly this is very ambitious. I think it's very welcome. It's a real um, attempt to try and make rail uh, a choice for people who currently use car, for example, on, on commuting. Uh, we have had changes uh, since COVID in terms of how people are travelling. Uh, currently, over the piece, there's 70% uh, of the commuting um, passengers are back, but that's not to full complement. We're seeing elsewhere in the system very strong return. For example, Saturday is now the busiest day. So in terms of preparation, um, the, this has been work that's been ongoing um, since the announcement that this would happen. We've just confirmed the dates. Um, so October the 2nd is when that um, the, the, the pilot starts. Uh, some of the issues will be on capacity, and I, I've made it clear to, to Scott Rail need to one make sure the communication is very strong. Um, uh, they've also made sure that, particularly on the Glasgow Edinburgh line, there will be um, all seven eight uh, carriages will be used for for the for the, uh, the journeys. Some of them have been four to date. That's not going to happen during this period. And clearly, in some of the other areas, they've added on, particularly in the sort of the Glasgow Alexandria, I'm sorry, Alexandra kind of area, um, that's also going to have a, a additional carriages to come in. I do th would advise people that this is very welcome. I think people will see this as a big, um, a big step forward. It will help people with affordability, particularly, because for many people, rail is just the cost of it is too prohibitive during that journey time. Uh, but um, I would recommend that everybody looks and watches the, the ScotRail communication because they may need to adjust when they travel because I suspect there'll be far more, um, you know, far, far more appetite. Uh, obviously, it's a pilot, so we don't know what will happen in changes. Clearly, we've got hybrid working. Um, this may encourage more people to come back into to offices. We, that's part of looking at it. Mm -hmm. But also, we want to try and assess, does this see that shift from car to, to rail that in terms of that decarbonisation, reducing emissions, is, is all about. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, if I can move on then to the, the rail decarbonisation plan, um, I think we we'd do a, a refresh plan quite soon. And I, I'm interested in what kind of changes we might expect to see coming through that and whether we're still going to be on track for delivering a decarbonised national rail service by, I think, midpoint of 20. 2030s. So there's, there's obviously this is a, a big challenge for everybody. I think we're all seeing the, the impacts of, of climate change globally and also locally. Um, and in terms of our responsibilities, transport 
as one of the, the major emitters, has to take steps forward. We've, I've, I said in my opening remarks that the electrification that, that's happening in Barhead, that's a major line that's um, just to be complete uh, and by December we're, we're anticipating. And also in terms of East Kilbride, that we've announced that and that, that work will commence. I'd also say, and I know that you've got an interest in the Evermouth uh, <laughs> rail line, that's ready for electrification as part of that wider work that will need mm -hmm. to take place. And clearly um, the big next steps would be in terms of the, the kind of Fife um, Aber Aberdeen lines. But these are all subject to kind of setting out plans, budgets, etc. But in terms of that kind of commitment and vision, there are other parts of the UK that I think look very enviously in what's happening in Scotland because there is that determination and activity. In fact, I'm due to speak at a major rail uh, conference this afternoon and there's a lot of interest from um, elsewhere as to what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. Lots of challenges. Um, uh, lots of activity um, and lots of commitment from the partners to deliver on that decarbonisation. But you're correct in saying there will be a refresh of that real decarbonisation mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another issue which um, you know has been highlighted, particularly in the media and, and you know around around the whole of the UK, has been the closure of ticket offices. Now, I think that I think you previously said that you know there'll be no closure of ScotRail ticket offices. Certainly not during this session of Parliament. I'm just wondering if you could, if you could clarify you know, where government thinking is then around other changes such as reductions in, in opening hours. So I think it's really important and for MSPs in this committee and elsewhere to, to, to be quite aware that there will be no closure of ticket offices, ScotRail ticket offices in Scotland. Um, I think the uh, very effective campaign that's been run across the UK for I think what would be a, a da damaging policy elsewhere um, has has impacted, I think, on people in Scotland. So some MSPs have written to me thinking that, and they've got constituents worried about their local office. And I, I want to affirm that there will be no ScotRail ticket offices closing. Um, I, I also have written to Hugh Merriman, the, the UK minister, to express concern. I think particularly with people with disabilities. I think that's a major issue that we need to, to, to account for. And what we have said that should the uh, one office, the, the Advanti Glasgow Central, close, there would still be a, a ability to buy tickets via our offices. So, I mean, that's, that, that's something that, that, that's there. But um, I think in terms of that wider look at rail, uh, there are are still, we're still looking at how, and ScotRail is still looking at primarily, and this is an operational matter for them, but they're still looking about how they most effectively deploy staff. Because one of the things we know, and you've heard it directly from, from the rail unions as well, is uh, safety issues and uh, antisocial behaviour is an issue. And we know that presence of staff, whether it's on, on platforms or on trains, make a big difference. So the travel safety officers that have now been deployed, we know are making a difference already. So the issue is, do, will, um, will everybody always be behind the ticket desk or will they be supporting um, other work in, in the stations? And that work is ongoing. We look to, to try and look at that review and, and bring that to some kind of uh, conclusion to give certainty, I think, to staff as well. But we, we, we do want to work, and we have worked, and we have a, a very good and effective relationship um, with the trade unions. And I should point out that we are not having any real disputes currently in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a point of ongoing discussion with rail unions then about the customer-facing roles and how that can be deployed. That, that be has deployed to continue with, with, with the unions, and, and I think you know the important thing is to provide that you know certainty and stability that there will be no office closures, but we want to make sure that there's kind of workable, sensible operations for the, the stations. But that has to involve uh, unions and what their, yeah. their views are on that. And certainly there are no strikes taking place in Scotland. And yeah. I want that kind of attitude and relationship to, to continue so that we can continue to make sure that we've got effective working with our unions. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you. Just before we uh, leave um, railways, if I may, um, Minister, before uh, the railways were nationalised, uh, one of the reasons that was given was that Abellio wasn't meeting the public performance measures, um, and that was always uh, used against them. Now, with less trains and less work going on on the railways, uh, the Scottish Government is still failing to meet them. What's the reason for that? So, in terms of the performance of 
of ScotRail. It is outperforming the majority of um, rail operators elsewhere. Uh, do we want to drive improvements in performance? Yes. Um, my understanding, and I knew that, that I think that in the last bill, it may be uh, believed to, to maybe uh, check me if I'm incorrect in my figures here, but my understanding up to August, the performance rate was at 89%, and we were looking at it to be over 90%. But actually, the most recent announcement was just last week, I think, and that also showed an increase in performance. If, uh, you've... if I may, Minister, the, the announcement last week was the independent national passenger satisfaction survey, and that one came through with 91% passenger satisfaction, uh, which is significantly above the average for the rest of the network. Um, but I think the figure perhaps the convener is asking about is the 92.5% um, passenger performance measure figure, uh, and ScotRail has not delivered that, but is working hard to do so in collaboration with Network Rail, because actually in Scotland we manage the railway as a system with a single target, unlike what happens south of the border, um, and there has been good progress. Again, we are not satisfied because they're not yet at the target. Others look on what we're doing uh, with a measure of jealousy and, and awe, frankly. I'm, I'm sure other people, and, and comparing one's, one to oneself to another person and saying you're better, although not, you're not reaching the standard that you aspire to, is not really a, a measure of, of performance in my book. So I go back to the question. The uh, public uh, performance measure, not the public satisfaction, the public performance measure has not been <coughs> met since nationalisation. And it was one of the reasons given for nationalisation. When do you think you're going to achieve it? And what happens if you haven't achieved it in, say, six months' time? There's nowhere to go after nationalisation, is there? So, in terms of uh, our, the performance standards, we uh, treat them very seriously, and we will uh, make sure that, in terms of the delivery, that that is uh, reinforced. Um, and, and I have done that already, and in terms of looking at um, the, the next plans across the UK, I've made it quite clear um, to those in charge of that of that, that I expect that um, performance standard to be part of the plans and the expectations in terms of that performance. So, you're, you know, in terms of this passenger satisfaction is strong, but real performance in terms of, um, I suppose, delivery that you're requiring, we're not meeting the standards that we have set and that we are clear about what we expect to, to achieve. So, you're right to identify it, but all I can say to you is that we are driving that, that forward, that improvement. The direction is in the right, it's going in the right direction. Uh, your issue is how the pace and how can we deliver that. Um, and you know, in terms of that customer focus, I think we, we have seen since the uh, public ownership and control of uh, ScotRail that that focus on customer has, has really been driven forward. And you can see that. I think any of, the, any of us that regularly use the rail system will know that. Um, but in terms of that uh, time and delivery, we need to make sure we have a reliable but safe railway. And uh, we'll be looking at that performance management. And I'm sure user committee will come back to that to identify how, how that performance standard is being reached. Uh, bizarrely enough, uh, Minister, I've been listening to those insurances 2016, since I first joined the committee that dealt with transport and trains. I heard them from Alex Hines when he was in charge of Abellio, and I've, I've now heard them from you. And in six months' time, I'm sure we will come back. But on that note, I'm going to move on to the next questions, uh, which are going to come from, I think it, it's Monica, isn't it? Yes, Monica. That's correct, convener. It's my turn. Good morning, Minister and um, officials. I really welcome Mark Ruskell asking about the ticket offices and your um, reassurance minister that there will be no closures in Scotland. I should say that I'm speaking at the AGM of Disability Equality Scotland later today as their patron, which is in my voluntary register of interest, and people will really welcome that. I think you said that the opening hours is an operational matter um, for ScotRail, but I just wonder... If you can clarify, is it your view that you wouldn't want to see any reduction in the uh, capacity and availability of the staffed ticket offices? In terms of the, there was an original proposal um, that had been would have have seen that reduction in time in, in numbers that were staffed, and that's mm -hmm. now. As I said, there, there aren't going to be any closures. Okay. In terms of the time and the, the, the capacity, I think that's still an issue just to finally resolve how we get the service improvement that's needed, give the... the you know, I think that kind of sense of um, assurance that there are staff available at stations. Mm -hmm. And the issue is, do 
you know, how much time people are going to be spending mm -hmm. behind the ticket office as opposed to helping you know, people with disabilities or yeah. you know, the, the other needs that are at a station. And those have changed in, in, you know, since maybe kind of five, ten years ago mm -hmm. of what those expectations are. OK, well, we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about antisocial behaviour. I was looking back at the official report from one of your last sessions as my buddy here as, as a deputy convener, but it's a real issue, isn't it? And I know that some of the questions that, that you asked um, are real union colleagues. Um, you totally understand it. There's been some really serious issues around antisocial behaviour and violence, both you know, affecting the public, but also the workforce that, that you mentioned in your earlier remarks to Mark Ruskell. So I wonder if you can say a bit more about the action that Government and Transport Scotland has been taking um, to tackle this and to understand the root causes of that antisocial behaviour and, and criminality. So it anybody who is committing a criminal offence should be reported and I also think that it's really important that people do that um, mm -hmm. and uh, I would encourage people to do that. In relation to antisocial behaviour, I think this is an issue mo that's more wider in society and uh, there's, you know, in terms of that kind of, I suppose, wh why is that happening? I think there may be issues that are post-pandemic mm -hmm. in terms of um, you know, behaviour issues in, within some groups as to what was boundaries that might might not have been acceptable, but people think they're acceptable now, and I, that's maybe a complex area that that needs to be be looked into. So I'm not going to say this is just rail specific or even just transport specific. I think you see that in in different other walks of life. And um, I'm I'm due to meet with the community safety minister about this general issue from a government point of view. In terms of um, operationally, I know that there's been close working again with between the unions and and. ScotRail um, and others in terms of trying looking at the how to manage um, uh, you know social behaviour and I've, I'd heard more recently in one of my meetings with unions that there'd been a very good recent meeting in terms of what can happen. Th this matters so much not least for people feeling safe and secure and travelling but also for the workforce mm -hmm. themselves. The deployment of um, 34 um, travel safe officers um, has been a fa fairly recent development and I think the feedback from that um, that does seem to be helping, and, and I think that's identify. I think that's smart thinking about identifying where and when there might be issues, etc., and anticipatory. And but presence does make a difference, I think. And and I think for women and girls in particular, and I will take forward uh, the previous minister's uh, work on women and girls and, and safety issues. Um, and I, I want to bring together all everybody that's involved in that mm -hmm. and has been. There was a very good report produced um, at the initiation of the former minister, and I want to try and pursue that because we want to to. Increase that, but I wouldn't want to say it's just about rail. I think it's there's underlying issues. I think we can do tactical things within rail as we can in bus, or we can do in in other areas. But I think there's a general issue that I think needs to be um, more widely addressed as to what is acceptable or unacceptable behaviour, and that probably needs a more wider society to think about: is that really acceptable, and should people behave like that? And um, so I think that's. Uh, I mean, that's, that's quite a general answer, but to, to reassure you, I do think it's serious and important. I have had the conversations, particularly with unions and that, and also with ScotRail, and also I want to drive forward the kind of safety issue, uh, particularly with women and girls, and look at practical ways that we can ha make the railways safer for, and more secure and more comfortable for everybody to, 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 you know, to travel on. No, that's really helpful. I agree there is that wider context, but just to bring it back to rail staff because it's really good to hear there's now you know over 30 travel safety officers they've got an important role hopefully that will help improve public confidence and get people using the rail network in greater numbers but rail unions including the rmt and i'm a member of the rmt parliamentary group but all the rail unions have raised concerns about their members mm -hmm. who are very much on the front line of this so um what will you be doing to look at their safety and their well-being in particular and, and how they feel about it because as we know a lot goes unreported we don't always get the full picture but as we deploy more and more workers to try and deal with issues they might be the ones that have to absorb a lot of the the abuse so 
what specific actions will be taken to, to really protect them and to make sure that there is a zero tolerance culture across the real network? So you're right to identify you know, the zero tolerance culture, mm -hmm. um, and that's in the workplace and also for passengers. Um, it really is a matter for ScotRail as to how they implement that from a management and deployment point of view. Um, and it's an area that, as I said, I've already, in my short time um, as Minister, had a number of conversations in this area and will continue to do that. Um, I also think when we talk about staff, we also need to look at the position of women as well. Um, mm -hmm. We recently had um, ASLEF in the, in the Parliament and they were um, celebrating their 100th women driver. Um, and also we had an event in Parliament that uh, Graham Simpson host hosted and it was Women in Rio. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got frontline staff, I think any staff, there should be zero tolerance of, of bad behaviour. But if we're trying to increase and, and try to encourage more women into rail, then we have to make sure that the workplace is somewhere that they've, they'll feel comfortable in working in. So I think that's why we have to take it from different, you know, different perspectives and different lenses. But I don't know, Bill, is there anything else specific you would want to, to add to that? I, I think just to say there's a good deal of, of work between ScotRail, the British Transport Police, uh, the transport authorities uh, coming together to explore whatever initiatives are, uh, are possible. And there's a, there's a range of uh, measures being deployed, including, for example, discussions with uh, rail unions about the further use of body-worn cameras and the extent to mm -hmm. which that might help uh, with the security of staff. It is, it is an awful problem and, and, and the, the, the behaviours on the railway reflect the behaviours around the railway and folk come into the railway and behave in that manner. So I think it is a wider issue, but it's something I think there's a strong alignment of interest uh, between Scott Rail managers and staff and indeed ourselves about what can we do, what practically can be done to, to address this uh, I think growing uh, concern about um, about social behaviour and and as many things, the solutions will come from those that are in the workplace and mm -hmm. operating there. So we need to listen to them as opposed to say we think this was, is what will work. I think that's why that dialogue yeah. is very important. Well, issues that I'm sure we'll return to, but thank you for those updates. Thanks, uh, Monica Douglas. I think you've got a question here on the chat. Yes, um, thank you, Kavina, and it follows on from uh, Monica Lennon's questions um, in terms of antisocial behaviour and, and violence towards. Um, uh, staff, does that make the ban on alcohol? Does that is that going to continue? What's the government's thinking um, on that area? So, so our position, and it's a position that the the previous minister uh, has taken, is that that should continue. And I think, um, in terms of that respective um, issue, particularly late at, late at night, and for women travelling on on rail, um, the experience of being um, you know, on on uh, on trains where uh, excess alcohol has been taken um, it is a problem. I think anybody who travels on rail will know that and see that and experience that. So that is our current position. But if I remember right, it, it did start off a, a sort of ban after nine o'clock, yeah. I think, and then was and then was was then changed. I'm just trying to. I'm, I'm not saying I'm for it or anything. I'm just trying to understand the government's position on if they're going to review that and when they would review it. So. Uh, my understanding, and, and I might come back to you on this because it's not an area that I've had particular focus on, and Bill might be able to give more, kind of more recent information, but it, it was something that had been uh, brought in, and it brought, brought in at the time of the pandemic in particular, and then because we were concerned about how people might behave and the spread of, you know, of, of, of COVID at that time. Um, but also there was a, I mean, a recognition that it did change people's behaviour, or was helpful in changing behaviour. Um, so. I would say that it would, there are sometimes requests for it to be changed, but the last time that that request was made, um, the minister was quite clear at that time. But Bill might be able to give you more information. It, it, it is striking. It's an issue that, that you get a, a wide range of views about. I think just, for example, taking the staff's view, uh, the drivers' union, ASLEF, remains in favour of the ban continuing. Interestingly, last time we spoke with the RMT, they were in favour of the ban being lifted. Um, although that's a very practical reflection about uh, whether we might be better off focusing, for example, British Transport Police resource on particular trains and having a more tolerant attitude at other times. There's a, there's a big debate about this, and it's something, Minister, we've been continuing to work with yeah. ScotRail, listening to the views of staff, and we were proposing to bring you some further advice yeah, about so that. But it's, it's, not, it's not an issue where there is a settled view. There are strong views held uh, for, for, uh, for... And I guess that's cost. because... Obviously, there is a, a, a ban at present, but in terms of ScotRail staff, I, I think they've been told they're not the police. They're not there to enforce it, and I guess because there's not police on every train, it's, then it's difficult to enforce. 
Well, I think that's maybe a good question for, for ScotRail in terms of the experience that they've had, but um, in observation, that, that, that then leads to te some tensions that can cause difficulties, and you, mm -hmm. you people will have seen people... Yeah. And, and I, in ways they shouldn't have done. So. Yeah, and I guess a lot of these issues, you know, alcohol on board, antisocial behaviour, switch to rail, this was all meant to be covered by the, I think it was called the National Rail Conversation. Now, I think it was meant to be launched in April, so can you give, a, give me an update of what's, what's taken place since, um, since that six-month period? So all, all these issues are in constant dialogue, and I think that's what's good about our kind of operation, that we do um, have regular... Um, dialogue with unions and management about how we improve things on, on rail and indeed other modes of, modes of transport. In terms of the, the national conversation, you might be aware that obviously around about April we had the change of first minister, we had change of minister and then subsequently um, uh, you know, my appointment, so there's been quite a lot of flux and change. In coming in to post, um, my view is that we should focus on delivery. Um, rather than general conversation. So all these issues um, don't need a national conversation for us to, to, to engage with them. I think there is that kind of opportunity for that regular uh, dialogue, particularly with the management and indeed the operators and the interest groups. So, for example, Monica Lennon referred to mobility access groups and there's a mobility access committee who've got um, leads particularly on rail. They've been quite clear about what their views and needs are and we're obviously embarking on the uh, peak fear uh, removal pilot. So there's a, there's a lot of activity in this area and as Minister, I'm quite keen to focus on delivery. So I don't think that's the national conversation will take place in the way that was probably previously envisaged by previous ministers, but now I'm the minister. My view is I need to focus on delivery, and that's what I'm going to do. OK, so the national real conversation, as we had laid out before, that's no, no longer I don't, I don't, place. I, I, I think things have moved on a bit since then. OK, thank you. I'll move on to my, my uh, next question. Um, as a, as a four-year-old lad, I remember getting on my first Intercity 125 train before it even started school, and that was 48 uh, years ago. Minister, but in Scotland, we're obviously still got the, the HSTs in place. Now, the rail union, unions have expressed their concern at the crash worthiness of these trains following on from the, the Carmont derailment. So, what is the current plan for retiring these trains? So in, in terms of ensuring that we have uh, safe trains operating, that's, uh, the, that's uh, essential. In terms of um, the, rev the review that took place and indeed the continuing work of the um, replacement um, of the HSTs um, and indeed looking at that work, that obviously um, is continuing, but the reassurances that we've had from those that looked particularly at um, the real safety position of the HSTs, they are satisfied that they can still run and can run safely. The unions are also involved in the replacement um, discussions that are taking place and the timing for them. Clearly, what we want to do is have a real decarbonisation that would lead to replacement of the HSTs by um, you know, elect you know, you know, electrified uh, systems. And the timing of that depends on... So there's a lot... Of, mm -hmm. You can imagine there's a lot of things in play here. And so clearly the timing for replacement will tie in with how we can you know, advance the electrification. There are some, and I've heard calls to try and mid... I suppose midstream replace them with other diesels. But that then is the cost expense of, of that. And that would then may, in terms of knock-on impact, um, may not help in terms of that drive towards electrification. Mm -hmm. So these are all things in play. Um, but the most important thing is we've got a, a steering group that's looking about the HST replacement that is involving everybody that's necessary, including unions mm -hmm. um, as, as well as... So would management. you expect the East Coast electrification to happen before it has to happen before the trains are replaced, but do you, do you expect it to happen before 2030? Um, in terms of the timescales for that, Bill, can I maybe ask you to, well, that's to reply part to of that? the work currently um, as part of the the refresh yeah. of the decarbonisation action plan. Sorry, oh, sorry. my apologies. The, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was saying that, that, that these are all issues that are linked to the uh, refresh of the decarbonisation action plan for rail about what the optimum programme is for delivery. Um, uh, so, so there are works underway now. For example, the the the, the some of the power supply points for uh, the electrification into Fife and beyond. Some of that. 
have already been ordered. Uh, the development work for the electrification uh, to Aberdeen is continuing. Um, the, the timescales remain to be confirmed as part of this refresh work. But, sorry, this last point. But would it be possible to have it electrified by 2030? Because we're only talking about you know, seven years away. It seems quite optimistic, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, that's part, part of the work is to how do we make sure everything's aligned, that we can do the work, finance the work, make sure that we've got the, um, the, you know, the carriages and the, the, the mm -hmm. trains that we'll need, etc., and, and have that timing. And it's that, that's, so the aim is to have that decarbonisation to, to happen by 2030. That is what we want to try and obviously continue to achieve, and that's what... Um, and, and you still think that's realistic? Well, that's I, I, I'm, I'm a politician. I'm not a rail expert. Yeah, so in terms of, for... And that's actually why we do ask the experts to... To, to advise us in terms of that time scale of what's possible when etc uh, but in terms of um, you know the, the the drive you know that's we've, we've got the intention to do this we just have to make sure we put all our ducks in a row in terms of making sure that that can happen and that's the realistic thing you would do and that's why you might as well ask about it the real decarbonisation refresh plan will help do that is there anything else that anybody wants to do on that so I understand it when you took over the uh, <laughs> The railing stock, as part of the nationalisation, presumably there would be a contract for the leasing of the railing stock, which would include HST. When's the first time you can get out of that contract? Oh, that's 2030. Sorry? 2030. So we'll start with HST till 2030, because otherwise you'll be in breach of contract. Uh, well, uh, it may be possible to bring in other trains, but we'd need to be persuaded of the economic merit of that. Yeah, so there may be a, an incredible cost as well if we try and get it before 2030. I'm going to go to the Deputy Convener for the next question. With, um, ben. Thank you, Convener. G good morning, Mr. and panel. I have a, a question about uh, prohibition on pavement parking, uh, drop curb parking and double parking. Uh, Minister, will be aware of how much of a, a problem this is, particularly in uh, urban environments, uh, including my constituency, and I'm, I'm grateful for your response to me in, uh, earlier this month. But I would just be grateful of, uh, for the benefit of the Parliament as a whole if you could uh, confirm that Scottish Ministers remain committed to introducing a ban on parking on the pavement in front of drop curbs uh, and double parking, uh, and when this will take effect in terms of the implementation of the uh, relevant provisions in the Transport Scotland Act 2019. So I might refer to, to colleagues for the actual date, but that's part of my opening remarks. I, I referred to a number of um, SSIs that would be coming forward to the, the Committee on Pavement Parking, and some of the provisions within that and the Transport Act have already been laid to, to Parliament. Um, in terms of, I don't know, Alison, can you maybe help on the final yeah, date? So the, so the current date that we're working to for the pavement parking legislation is the 2nd of October, um, with a view to it coming into force in December. Uh, so that's off the back yeah. of all of the consultation work that we did over the previous sort of 18 months, etc. Um, so that is the current intention for the pavement parking work. So it's still on schedule, and uh, as it, yeah, because yeah. the December 23 has um, been the proposed implementation date for some time. And, and just around that period, uh, will there be uh, any public information or comms? Because I can only speak from my experience in terms of my constituency, but unfortunately it seems that more people feel that it's uh, OK to park uh -huh. on the pavements and there will be some culture change uh, required as, as part of this. I, I think there will need to be a lot of communication around that. And again, it's about what's acceptable or not, because currently some people think it is acceptable. Actually, it's not acceptable now, but obviously with the, um, the regulations it will be um, something that will be more evident and that's something that we'll work closely with our local authorities uh, colleagues on and councils is to make sure that the communication is um, is clear to people but I, I, it's um, it's an issue that has a surprise well, not maybe surprising but you know, quite a considerable amount of concern from people and the number of people that contact MSP, MSPs I'm sure and you know people should be able to use their pavements and have feel comfortable in doing that and it's yes people will um, you know, everybody, but if you're wheeling in any shape or form, whether it's in a wheelchair or indeed mothers with buggies and you can't get through, um, then I, this is not your, you know, how do you, how do you feel comfortable in, in your own environment, in your own place? So this is about making people feel comfortable to be active and, and have, you know, act, you know walk, walk and cycle and, and wheel in their own areas, not cycling on the pavements clearly, but, you know, in terms of that, that wheeling um, aspect. So... It, and there was a lot of publicity around it but when there was a remember there was Sandra White had that the, the legislation so um 
at that time there was a lot of profound publicity. It's maybe something that committee may be able to help with and other MSPs. So when we lay the, um, the, the, the well, there's different series of regulations, but the 2nd of October ones for the, the December 4th implementation, it may be helpful if we can all try and raise the profile of it. Absolutely, and I'll be um, warmly welcomed in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith and elsewhere in the country, I'm sure, and not just for the reasons that you state around uh, mobility and, and uh, the, the pavements being, being there for those, those who use them, and uh, they shouldn't be blocked, but also the quality of the paving themselves, and uh, too, too many yeah. uh, streets are being um, damaged by pavement parking in terms of the, the weight of vehicles, and so uh, grateful that uh, okay. everything's running to time. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you. Um, next questions come from Ash. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. I want to turn now to ferries. So, obviously, the committee uh, put together quite a comprehensive report, which the Minister was obviously uh, part of the committee at, at that time. And we've received um, a response back from the government, so that was just at the end of last month. And it did suggest that consideration would be given to the suggested merger between CMAL and Transport Scotland Ferries Division. So my question would be, when will the Scottish Government announce um, what the new institutional structure uh, might look like and, uh, or, and when that might take place? So, um, and I, I just want to repeat this, and many of you may have heard this, that, that I was Deputy Convener when the Ferries Inquiry was taking place and took the evidence sessions, but at the time of the final production of the report, I was no longer a member of the committee and, and I was a minister. Uh, and I think it was appropriate that the Cabinet Secretary responded to the committee as a report, which I thought was a very good report. And um, I think, and I hope that you, you recognise it was a good response in terms of addressing all the issues from the um, from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this is absolutely live and active in terms of my consideration. I think there are some competing issues. Um, clearly, when the committee made its recommendations um, of the governance review, and quite clearly there have been recommendations for a, number, for, you know, for a period of time um, of the need to look at the governance and the change, um, at that time, Angus Campbell's community board uh, review of the ferries hadn't taken place, or had, it was taking place, hadn't reported. Uh, he's now reported, and that is now uh, published on, on Transport Scotland's website. Their view was the merger should be between um, CalMac and CML, which is not the same as, as, as the committee's. To be fair to the committee, I think the committee also said we need to be a cognizance of what the, the, the communities want. Um, we want simplicity. We want improvement at all levels. Um, and I'm acutely aware of that, having spent the summer spent, you know, speaking and visiting a number of island ferry communities um, directly. Obviously, the committee heard a lot of evidence themselves. Um, I think there may be some tensions, um, which I think the committee itself alluded to, as to what could happen in terms of what you know, might be appropriate either legally or the consequences of that. So I'm looking very closely at that and I know the committee's interest as to the underpinning rationale of what is going to be able to be done as to what might be desirable to be done. I would say that in terms of um, the value of the, the government and uh, the, the value the government places on um, all the players in terms of Transport Scotland, CMAL and CALMAC. They all have, obviously have different strengths and abilities strategically. Um, obviously, the connections between um, Transport Scotland Ferries uh, Division and CMAL have to be very strong and needs to be very strong. And in, clearly, in terms of that um, expertise that, that CMAL have in terms of not just um, ferries, I would add, I'm very struck by the need to look at ports and harbours <laughs> as well in terms of looking at the, the assets and, and how they're dealt with. So the, the factors in play will need to be the decision about governance, which obviously comes you know, following the, the previous Project Neptune work as well, but it's the governance issue, the um, islands connectivity plan, and obviously issues around um, the uh, CHIS 3 in terms of that. So these are all connected, which our committee has previously identified. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the decision making that, I think this is a, a fairly major decision that needs to be taken. So I will also need to make sure that Cabinet is involved in that, and that's a process that we're currently involved in. So I can't prejudge that and tell you time, because I'm kind of dependent mm -hmm. a bit on um, decisions making you know, across government. Um, but um, you will 
you you will hear and you will hear fairly soon. So we'll be the the, the second to know about it then. Uh, That's probably. Yeah. That's, I think. I think. I think. In terms, I need to tell Parliament, obviously, but obviously, I need to get through yeah. through Cabinet. But that would be. A, you know, we need to announce that to Parliament, and clearly, with the interests of this committee, um, we'd make sure the committee and alert the committee when that's that's due. Okay. Um, the Scottish Government has set out that they don't think that the independent uh, ferry regulator is the appropriate way to go forward. So, can I ask you then, how do you think? it's possible to ensure I think what the, the committee and I think communities as well we're looking for is a, um, a strong oversight of these lifeline ferry service provisions so I think as the committee knows a lot of these issues stem from the need for uh, resilience in the fleet so the focus on those six ferries is, uh, and the delivery of them is, is, is absolute but within that, then, it becomes the operation. And I think in terms of how that can be improved, um, in terms of driving up standards of um, management and communication, I think there are issues in terms of CalMAX communication and relationships, and they know that. And when I met with them, I made clear my views and my concerns about their lack of customer focus. But they themselves have acknowledged that, and they're making steps to, to improve what they do. And clearly, at the end of the day, that's an issue for the board, um, who have oversight of, the, of, of CalMAX themselves. The way I think we can try and address some of these issues is in the next uh, CHIFS 3 contract and, and whoever would be delivering that in terms of what the expectations are of the standards. And I think some of the points that are particularly strongly made in the um, communities uh, board report in terms of what those expectations would be, we can try and build them into um, the contract. Similarly, um, the committee's report themselves had a number of issues within that, and also the principles by which um, any new contract should be judged. So, in terms of driving that change and improvement, that can and should be done through that contract change as well. And it also requires um, a, a cute, acute and fastidious ministerial oversight, although obviously not interference to things that are the matter for the board or indeed the, the management. And I'd like to reassure the uh, committee, having spent a considerable amount of time looking at the ferries issues, I will take an absolute very keen and active interest in that. That's good to hear. Um, the Scottish Government has indicated that a decision on whether to tender uh, or directly award the next Clyde and Hebrides ferry service contract has yet to be made. So if I can ask the Minister, when does she think that decision will be made? And do you intend to award CalMAC ferries um, a contract extension um, to allow for any future arrangements to be established? So similar to your first question as to the governance issue and when that be, be resolved, the, these are all part of connected um, issues in relation to what happens to the governance, what happens to uh, CHIFS 3, and also uh, what happens in, in terms of um, that kind of wider improvement delivery um, exercise and the, inter, inter, um, the island's connectivity plan. So these are all part and parcel, so I'm looking at them in the round. I think that was a recommendation from the committee that these things should be looked at in the round because some of, the, some of these issues have been dealt with sequentially. Um, so I can't give you that to you know, certainty of date, but I can tell you that in terms of my priorities, I'm, you know, this is, this is certainly something that I'm uh, having regular and constant contact with my officials in order to get us into position mm -hmm. that I can make that announcement. And as I've said to my answer, obviously I know the committee's keen interest to know that and will alert you to, to when that will be as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, can I just push you a, a little bit on that? We are running out of time as far as, uh, going out to tender for the contract and it was one of the, probably I, I, I felt one of the most difficult decisions to make is to make a recommendation that it was awarded again to CalMAC and it's probably some of the things that Islanders have mentioned that they think how can you give it to CalMAC when they have been so bad at delivering what they've been delivering for the last contract period so could you give me a, a I think I want to push you on when we're going to get an answer and also I'd like to know some of the key things that you're going to do to reassure Islanders that if it is a direct award um, that you will be right on top of the delivery of that service because the figures we got from CalMAC were opaque to say the least on their delivering of standards. 
So I'm acutely aware of the timescale for this, uh, both in terms of the uh, provision for uh, retendering or indeed extension, etc. I'm not going to give you any information about what I'm going to recommend to, to my Cabinet colleagues as to what we should do on that. Um, but you will be one of the first to know because of, of your responsibilities and your, and your interests. So that's as much as I can tell you just now. In terms of driving the improvement, I think you're right to identify the tensions here. Um, and there are merits and demerits, clearly, in terms of uh, the recommendations of, of the committee, and I think you acknowledge that. I think in terms of the uh, views, and I, I would lean heavily on my experience of talking to, to ferry committees um, in meetings and indeed in visits over the, the last few months, uh, and I think they want to see service change and improvement. Some of that is about <coughs> attitude and behaviour, and it's about relationship management. Um, I won't underestimate, and I'm not going to shy away from the fact that the, the lack of resilience in the fleet has consequences, and it's CalMAC who are having to deal with that. Um, I would also um, make it quite clear that the frontline staff of CalMAC are continuously supported and praised by communities, because quite often they are the ones that have to kind of deal with the immediate issues. Um, there are changes that I would expect to see, um, particularly on some of the business-to-business -business aspects. I think freight, for example, we have to recognise the economic value and the importance, as I know the committee has, has done, about the role of freight going forward. And indeed, if we do want to see um, the expansion of uh, economic activity in our islands, uh, because we need to see that, and that's happening already from renewable energy or indeed Isla from, from whisky, for example, um, that that's built into the, the, the changes and improvements and indeed service standards. And in terms of how um, how whoever operates the uh, either CalMAC currently or whoever would operate it in the future would have to um, have to deliver on. So these are service standards that we could you know, build into any future contract. And I think it's also incumbent on the board. And I've, I've met with the, the chair of the board um, that I what I would expect from them because I can't and I shouldn't micromanage the CalMAC themselves. My relationship is with the board, and so I have to make clear what my expectations are, and I can. Really assure you that on my very first meeting with the chair of um, Dearing with Brain, I made clear that customer focus was one of one of my kind of key um, you know key aspects that I would want to have things delivered on. And so therefore, you know, I know you want me to answer everything now. I can't, but I will make sure that you're the first to know when we, when those decisions are finally taken. And probably fair to say, Minister, the committee have requested a debate on ferries and, and the report that we provided, which would not be unsurprising. We haven't been given a date yet, but when we get a date, I'm sure you'll be able to give us uh, complete answers to all the questions at that stage. I will go to the next questions, which come from Jackie Dunbar. Jackie. Thank you. Good morning, Minister and your officials. Um, I'm going to focus on the fear of... Uh, fair, fairs review today, if you don't mind. Um, can, are you able to provide an update on the progress of the fair fairs review? I know it's a tongue twister. And uh, are there any findings beginning to emerge that you can you can possibly share with the committee this morning? So um, yes, there are indeed. I'm, I'm meeting with officials just this afternoon to set out the next stages to make sure that we can report as we've intended by the end of this year. I think the fairs fair review is a bit of a tongue twister. And if I wanted to make any changes, I might change the title. That's <laughs> probably what I would do. Um, pro probably not least because it's not just about fares. It's actually about how we make sure that our public transport system is accessible and affordable. And um, prob because we have got such a, I suppose, fragmented system between what's, de you know, what's deregulated, for example, in bus, what is um, obviously uh, nationalised now in terms of rail, and um, looking at obviously the various issues as well, because there's various issues, what's subsidised, what has concessionary travel, and unlike you know, many other countries who have a probably more varied system of concessionary travel, we have two million um, people in Scotland who've got free concessionary bus um, travel, for example, just now. Um, so the Fairs Fair Review is looking at all those issues. There are plenty of suggestions of anomalies, of, and I know that's an issue that's been raised here, for example, about accompanied people um, who've got sight um, impairments, for example, on, uh, um, and challenges and disabilities on, on, on rail. Um, so there's, there's lots of individual things that under 22s on ferries, for example. Is there something that can be done from the inter-island um, aspect? So there's lots of individual things, but what we also want to try and do is to try and set some kind of um, parameters of what 
a, a, a kind of fair system might look like. Clearly, in terms of the operation of fairs, they get set in advance of a period. So the idea is to, to bring forward the report by the end of the year to make recommendations um, that can be started, not completed, but started to be implemented from the you know, 24, 25. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, can you can you tell us today if what engagement um, Transport Scotland have officials have had with their UK counterparts to maybe hear and learn any lessons from the two pound bus fare cap that was introduced in January? So I, I can maybe I don't know if, if Alice, Alison ever might want to say what if there's been any contact at officials level. Um, what I can tell you is that just. Um, Last Monday, I was I met with Richard Holden, um, MP, who's the transport. Well, he's the UK minister that has uh, transport responsibilities, and we, we actually did discuss their um, their experience. And so we'll exchange that. And we also have a um, what's, I'm trying to remember the title of it. It's interministerial group, which is brings together Wales and um, and uh, also uh, obviously the UK and the Northern Ireland executive but not ministerial at, at this stage uh, and that's one of the things I want to do is to make sure that we're learning from each other from lots of different aspects of their experience including um, on bus issues as well because everybody's doing things slightly differently and understandably we have a major um, you know in terms of expenditure 300 million pounds on concessionary travel you see currently the under 22s um, uh, currently is 84 million journeys that are taking place and in terms of the impact of that we know that we've, we've got many families dealing with cost of living issues and that's really helping in terms of um, that activity and um, in terms of helping families i also heard and this is i suppose you know, what does it mean to individuals um i visited in my own constituency uh, children first uh, hub and they were telling me how the under 22s bus travel is helping some of their looked after children and in terms of accessing basic things like health provision that they might not have gone to had it mm. been more dif difficult so i think there there are consequences and and in fact we know that obviously for for older people that idea of being able to to visit and travel and be active is really important so Part of you know, looking at the value of concessionary travel, don't underestimate the impact, particularly for individuals when we're looking at it. So we can talk about two million people, but that, that individual I was being told about that can benefit because as I looked after child, they're, they're managing to access provisions that perhaps they might not otherwise. That's a value that you can't put in, you know, in pounds, shillings, pence. So it'll be, um, it's on track. I will have um, you know, more information from this afternoon going through with officials uh, stages for delivery to have output for you to, to assess. But it's not just about fears. If I can give you that kind of sense, it's how do we actually have that kind of um, view as to how public transport can serve us. But Alison, do you want to come in on that? I think maybe just a couple of points just to add to that. So um, we are expecting to get some of the evaluation from the under 22 free bus. Um, if we don't have it already, it will be coming in shortly and we'll use that to help inform sort of any recommendations that we make to ministers. But I think, as the minister's already outlined, we've got quite a different offer uh, in, in terms of the level of support that we provide to passengers and bus services in Scotland. Um, so from our perspective and the, kind of the, the analysts that support all of that work, we look to draw on as much information and evidence as we possibly can. So the £2 cap for example, has been the approach that the UK government has taken in England, but in a very different context to the way in which we're operating. So when we're looking at all of these different approaches, we're trying to draw out the best in these and then present that to ministers that can, as a, a coherent and integrated approach to the way in which we pay for transport. And when I say we pay, I mean society, you know, what government contributes, mm -hmm. what passengers contribute, eh, etc. across the mode. So, so that is the challenge. Yeah, I think also the challenge as well is to get the routes in there as well. Um, because while we've got the, the under 22s, if they can't get to places for work or, or etc., then it's kind of defeating the purpose a little bit. Um, but that's another day's no, I, mean, I, I, I agree, and that's why accessibility is as yeah. important as affordability, and it's why, and I suspect from the figures I've seen, though this, this evaluation will demonstrate some of the areas that have got, um, and the, the, the take-up is fantastic, and particularly for those that can travel independently, the kind of um, um, over 12s, um, and then the figures are very, very strong. Uh, but it, the areas that have got 
less um, availability of, of buses, uh, then you have lower areas of uptake, and that includes my own constituency. As have I in mind, so I'm going to contact you out with okay. this committee in regards to it. Um, I should have invited that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my final question, and I, you, you, vet, you touched on it very slightly, is regarding some countries such as Australia, Austria and Germany have recently introduced national and regional traffic tickets that uh, provide access to almost all uh, public transport across our country for a low monthly cost. Can I ask, is this something that the Scottish Government have given any consideration to uh, introducing here? So I'm expecting to see that as part of the kind of the comparators okay. that um, Alison and Irvin talked about. I think that's what's interesting about that, that that's um, it's reduced fares. It's not, it's not no fare, it's some fare, um, and it's to encourage activity and use. Alison? I just see what we've done as part of the work is some international benchmarking, where we've looked again, we've looked at places like Germany, Austria, Denmark, and the types of approaches that they take to their ticketing systems. But again, just sort of bearing it back in the reality of the, the complexity of the transport system that we operate in, how do we then make that work for us? And again, that'll be something that Ms. Hislop will get an insight into later on this afternoon. Okay. But Thanks. there's some good stuff out there. So. Thank you. That's the convener. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Douglas, you've got some questions, I believe. Yeah, thank you. I've got some questions on um, EV charging, Minister. So I was just trying to work out how the Scottish Government can play its part and how the private sector also play their part so we can have a, a comprehensive charging network now and into the future. So we set out, it was one of the first things I did as, as Minister back in uh, June was the EV vision for Scotland where we're looking to work with the private sector to see an additional 6,000 um, EV chargers uh, put in before 2026. In terms of the current numbers, we understand that about 20,000 have been supported domestically and business by uh, government's support. In terms of going forward, clearly local authorities are taking you know, responsibility and trying to make sure that they've got full um, coverage in their own areas. Um, and in terms of that investment, um, I know that uh, you know, how we work with the private sector is going to be really important. Charge Point has been you know, supported um, by the Scottish Government for, for some time. That can continue in terms of that contract, I think, until 2026 around that area. Um, in terms of where we are, there was a report produced by the Department of Transport in terms of the, what they thought was the numbers um, of EVs themselves. Uh, that probably is a, an uh, underestimation, I think, by a, about 16 per cent in terms of the numbers that we have. We've got far more um, EV, as in electric vehicles, on our roads than probably was anticipated from, from that initial research. And we're trying to work. That's one of the things we're going to do with the other ministers is try and make sure we've got a good benchmark in terms of how we're monitoring numbers of EVs on our, on our roads, but also in terms of um, that charging. We've got a very good um, rate of charging compared to the rest of the UK outside London, which is very strong. But I think, as everybody knows, we need to try and improve that. And th there's that shift from initial subsidy, and, and I know I've had plenty of letters from MSP saying, hang on a second, the price is going up. Well, that's because you know, you've got private operators um, now f f you know, operating systems that previously had a, a great deal of subsidy. But it is that trying to, you know, you're not getting electricity for free now, you're going to have to try and um, obviously get that kind of additional support so that, which I make sure it's sent to the committee. You might have, it might have come to the committee before you remember, but the EV vision that is about how we work with the private operators. Um, I actually launched the EV vision in um, Michelin Park in Dundee, and I know the committee had previously visited and saw some of the innovative work there. Um, I also saw a mobile EV uh, charging uh, facility that was a kind of quite an innovation that can be used in rural and remote areas where there's been um, problems in the past and also for events etc. So there's quite a lot of private activity in this area, but I think it's a work in progress in terms of um, making sure that we have the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the kind of rollout that we all want yeah. to see. Because we, we had taken some evidence um, suggesting that it was difficult for 
private firms to actually come in and, and invest in EV charging. Is that something you've heard also? Because I wasn't quite sure what, what that was in relation to. Um, well, I, you need to, to let me know what that was mm. and, and you can maybe follow up that. But Alison, do you want to come in? So I think that's an interesting reflection. Um, so if I take us back to 2011, I think when we started to take quite a proactive role in the EV charging rollout in Scotland, and we've taken quite an interventionalist approach, I think we're now, and that's what's set out in the vision, at that pivot point where we need to be more mindful of what the role of government is in supporting EV charging so that there is a charging network across the country, but provide the space for commercial operators to come in. And that's the work that we are doing hand in hand with local authorities and regional transport authorities for each of those areas to come up with the kind of the proposal that they think best fits their area. And then that's the, the, the sort of the the steps it will then take to roll that out um, because, as you know, local decision making, local intelligence actually is probably the point that we're at. Um, and also ensuring that the investment that local authorities have made in the EV charging infrastructure is also then supported um, with the right level of um, commercial intervention as well. Mm -hmm. So we're at that pivot point, I think, okay. is where I would say. Uh, and, in, and in terms of where we are with EV charging, the, the numbers, are you, are you happy with where we are there? Obviously, we'd probably all like to be faster, but are we, are we on track, really? I, I think we are. In terms of, you know, we're about 73, was it 73 per 100,000 or whatever is our figure. We're the second um, strongest outside London in terms of provision. I don't think, I, I think we'll need to have far more. I think mean, everybody understands that. So how we do that and how we do that, generating private funding for it, because we've already invested about £65 million, which is a lot of money to help kickstart that interventionist aspect. So um, I'm, an, I'm not going to say I'm satisfied because I don't think that would be reasonable, because I think everybody knows that we need to, to improve that to give the confidence for everybody for travel. And I also, I think one of the things we want to try and look at, and I know the committee has been interested before, is how do we promote... Um, you know, uh, tourism using electric vehicles, and that we, again, that we need com you know, people to have confidence that they can do that. Um, and I think we've got a, 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 some way to go in that. But I think if we make that as our our driving aspiration, that also can help rural areas in terms of making sure that we've got EV um, availability for those who want to hire and uh, travel across our beautiful countryside using electric vehicles. Okay. Thank you, convener. Thank you, uh, Douglas. Next questions come from Monica. Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, I'm just wondering how important is bus to the government meeting its target of reducing car kilometres by 20% by the end of the decade? So I, I think bus is uh, crucially important in, in what we do. I think there's obviously different parts of the country have different types of connectivity, but for many uh, parts of Scotland, uh, the the bus in terms of you know in terms of passenger usage it's you know in terms of our um, percentage is like seventy nine percent of people who use public transport use bus so it's already a very important part of our our transport mix and um, in terms of um, how I think it's that connectivity when I was talking about the fair fair review that idea of accessibility and affordability and going back to the point in fact the convener's point right at the beginning about active travel but also about how we integrate transport hubs, whether it's railway stations, etc., with our bus network is really, really important. So the work, for example, that took place in Lanarkshire with the, the Motherwell station, that was really important to align and the work in partnership with the Regional Transport um, Authority there and how we could make sure um, that there is alignment with bus and we make sure it's easy for people to, to use bus to connect to rail, to, et cetera. Um, I think the challenges we have, um, as I think everybody's quite aware of, despite a considerable amount of subsidy into the bus system, and, and there has been, and that's been important, uh, we have a deregulated system, and so people and companies can decide which routes to run, et cetera, and they're running them on a commercial basis unless they're subsidised by local authorities, so they have to make decisions about that, and that's where some of those challenges are. So the, the work on the... Um, the community bus fund, which is also um, uh, an, an agreement with local authorities, uh, and there will be information about that published fairly, fairly soon. Um, that's um, helping them work out some of their priorities and the bus partnership fund as well. I think the bus partnership fund, if I was honest, is a bit kind of probably slower than I would have expected in terms of how that can be delivered to get more focus on bus. The more people use bus and the more 
that bus um, can have priorities, which I know is quite controversial in some places, but it makes it more um, reliable. And the more reliable buses are, the more people are likely then to use them rather than their, their, their cars. And so there is that kind of chicken and egg. A lot of this work is with... Um, you know, has to work with regional uh, transport partnerships with councils themselves. I've met with um, the COSLA lead in this area, uh, Councillor Gail, Gail McGregor, a number of times since I've come into post. So that relationship is really key because it's local councils that are determining where they want to have that priority for buses. So that's quite a kind of broad answer, but maybe touches on a number of issues in the, the, the bus area. <sighs> OK, no, that's, that's helpful. So we all need to get on the bus a bit more often. Um, putting aside the pandemic, which is not easy to do, but if we put the pandemic to one side, we can see there's been a decline in bus passenger numbers, um, you know, a trend that, that did um, predate COVID. That's despite the fact that on the part of the Scottish Government and partners, there's been a lot of pro-bus investment, pro-bus policy. So... What really explains this decline in bus patronage in Scotland? So th that was a specific area that the bus task force um, that the former uh, transport minister put in place had looked at and that brought everybody together, the operators and, and Transport Scotland and everybody together looking at a number of issues in bus and I chaired the, the final meeting of that um, um, earlier in the summer. The I think the key... Now, bearing in mind, we've also had those 84 million journeys by um, under-22s. Um, so that has obviously helped boost, boost numbers. What seems to be the kind of... Um, the challenge is over-60s uh, have not come back to bus um, as strongly as other passengers have come back to different other types of, of transport. And that could be for a variety of, me of reasons. It could... So, uh, in terms of... Um, what that means, that probably needs a, a bit, bit more particular study in terms of behaviours, but it could be that they've made decisions that um, they, for the, they, they prefer driving by car because post-pandemic a number of people are still concerned about health and general issues or, you know, they got used to doing that and haven't come back. Um, it could... It could be for a number of different reasons. Perhaps their work patterns had changed, you know, in terms of that age group. Maybe they decided, because we know that group, many of them have decided not to go back to work, even if they were eligible you know, and, and wanted to go back to work. So I, I think there's a number of different areas. So the over 60s in particular is what I think would be a target to try and get them back to bus. Uh, some of the discussions we've had is if they are using for leisure, how do we try and improve that? But then that's timings and availability. Bearing in mind, remember what I was saying about the busiest time for rail is actually now Saturdays, which again, you know, trying to interpret that from a behavioural point of view, why is that? Well, a lot of people, if they are hybrid working, actually do want to get out of the house and do something at the weekend, <laughs> etc. So... You know, there's 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 different behaviours here, which there's I'm sure there's kind of policy and anal uh, you know analysts looking at, but that's the main concern around buses that age group in particular and how to encourage them back on, and they also have to feel safe and comfortable and confident to to use the bus service, and that means about reliability as well, which obviously um, is an issue for for many modes to give confidence for people to travel by public transport. Okay, so there's a lot of different strands to this. You've touched on behaviours, attitudes, importance of affordability alignment um, if I can look at accessibility because you know many of us I think support the um, expansion of free bus travel for 22 year olds and under but what about those communities where the availability of bus has reduced I will mention Hamilton you would have expected me to mention the, the X1 which I have written to you about <laughs> recently but for those people over 60 and 22 and under who desperately want to get on a bus and the service is no longer there. And we've heard, including your time on the committee, Minister, about communities feeling like they're now bus deserts because there simply isn't a bus to, to get on. Um, what is being done? You know, you've probably got one of the toughest jobs in government um, and we all wish you well, but what has been done to really look at those areas where... The alignment is really out of kilter now because, yeah, we've got you know free bus travel, but the buses are disappearing. We've got companies saying big shortages of, of drivers as well. And, and again, there's big factors, post-Brexit issues as well. But 
are we really getting everyone round the table to look at this in a joined up way? Because when I speak to people in my local community in Hamilton, they just can't understand that an express bus service like the X1 that would take you from Hamilton to Glasgow no longer exists in a, in a really major town at a time when people are being asked to leave the car at home, choose active travel, you know, think about what you're doing in terms of climate and nature emergency, but the infrastructure and services people need are just simply not there. So I, the main, main thing to, to remind ourselves of um, in this area is that buses are deregulated, that these are private commercial operators working. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't try and bring everyone together to take a strategic view, which is why the bus task force was established <laughs> to try and address a number of this, uh, these issues, including um, the availability of bus drivers, because I know that for a period, actually, it was availability of bus drivers that was leading to the withdrawal of services. Um, not necessarily that there weren't um, custom for that. And that's an area I know that you've, you've written to me about. And I know mm -hmm. yeah. there's been very active um, work in this area on recruitment. It was an area that I discussed with um, from a, a kind of, I suppose, the... Uh, uh, the immigration aspects in relation to whether we can have it in terms of um, the, the access list for priorities for, for, for entry. Mm -hmm. I know that was something that, that we pursued uh, some time with um, Richard Holden, the MP, uh, my discussion with him, we, he was discussing, for example, uh, what we can, might be able to progress on um, helping uh, Ukrainians drive and our, our, our buses and the systems that are involved mm -hmm. in that. So he's going to update me on that. Um, I know in different areas there have been um, local campaigns um, to recruit drivers. So I know in West Lothian, the, the bus companies together with the council, together with the college, did a big promotion to encourage people to, 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 to drive buses. The feedback on that is from the to, from the operators is that there's less pressure now than there had been in the past in terms of driver recruitment. It doesn't necessarily mean that you then don't get drivers poached from one company to another, and that can cause issues. So um, addressing it from that point of view, in terms of the connectivity point, um, you've got to then identify when. Uh, when when do people intervene and when don't they and who has the power to intervene and who has the power to subsidise and that's the powers that the councils now have and um, they have had powers for some time to, to set up their own companies that's not happened to date the franchising regulations as i said have just been laid so that's something i know the the committee will be interested in and to take the, the example of the X1, because I knew that you might ask about it, so I tried to find out a bit of a history on it. And my understanding was that the decision to withdraw the service uh, is one that First Bus took in 2020, and that Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, so SPT, obviously the Transport Authority, assessed the need for a replacement service following the cancellation of the X1. However, due to other transport links in the area, including rail and bus links, they saw no case to put in place any form of fixed route supported su service, that subsidy. So that was a decision made by the relevant transport local authority in that area. Whether they'd want to make a different decision now, that would be, again, that's up to them. But I think that overall point, and it goes back to my answer to um, uh, Jackie Nabar in terms of uh, fair is fair. I think that you're, you're right to make the point about accessibility um, because if you haven't got a bus to go on, how can you then make that kind of shift? And there are many rural, and it's not just rural, it's semi-rural areas where people have to riot, rely on cars to get to work because there are no buses that run at the time that they want to, to, to do that. Um, and so there have been, um, you know, there have been powers and there are powers for councils to subsidise buses and prioritise mm -hmm. them. Um, and I don't want to just say it's up to councils and that's it, because I think they, under, they are under pressure as well. But bus has to be an integral part of this solution. And I think the laissez-faire deregulated market has not served us mm -hmm. in the way it can, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you know the end we might have expected. So therefore, how do we help? councils take more control over the key routes that they think are important and that's why these regulations that are part of the Transport Act 19, yeah. 2019 are coming forward. So a lot that's really helpful and again we'd love to have you out in Hamilton to, to listen to residents because taking the bus away in 2020 during the pandemic was really a cynical move but it needs to be looked at afresh and I, I appreciate it's not sitting entirely on, on your desk but it needs that collaborative approach. On the powers, because I think we all welcome them for local government, but the resource has to 
to match that. So the community bus fund, £74 million from Scottish Government, that's for all the local authorities. Glasgow are saying that to take control of a bus operator would cost them over £200 million. Is the £74 million enough in your assessment? Has that been looked at? What more can be done financially to support local authorities? So, um, in terms of the sort of initial phase of the, the community bus fund, it's it's not the figures I've got are much smaller than the ones that you're, you're referencing, okay. and that's to do with um, that's you know five million capital and then 750k in terms of um, the the revenue that can help support that, and that gives them the initial planning of what they can they might want to do and they might want to to affect in terms of that very very local community bus fund. I think you're probably talking more about. Um, the issues around bus partnerships and, and what can happen there. Um, the initial spend is obviously in, on their plans of what they think would be effective, and that also is you know, bus prioritisation, but also how they might work in partnership. And then there's obviously the... And in, in terms of the funds that are available, I think it's one you're referring to, and I'll, I'll get the name and I can write back to the committee if I've, I've got this wrong, but in terms of my understanding is that's the initial funding to help work out what the priorities are in partnership partnership with um, private operators to run certain areas and subsidise them. In terms of the scale of this, um, for franchising, it won't happen overnight. We're not saying it will, but we've got the, we've got the, um, the legislative backing to, to enable it to happen. But I think these are the key choices, and you as a committee will need to take a view as to if there is public funds, um, you know, what should be supported and what should be subsidised. And uh, you know, there's lots of subsidies that goes into lots of different types of public transport. But if you know, we as a government, you as a committee, the Parliament decides that bus needs to be prioritised, then that's something you can clearly communicate. And, um, and, and I'd refer that the Cabinet Secretary has responsibility for the budget for our area. But I, I think, again, I would refer to my point: advice from this committee is always helpful in terms of what priorities are needed in terms of public transport. But sure. you can't have everything. Yeah. And that's that's the big decisions that we're going to have to I appreciate take. the convener's giving me quite a bit of time. Monica, I know you want to ask one more question. I'm, I'm oh, going to have to slightly push everyone for short questions and short answers, uh, because there are other people who want to come in. Um, and um, that said, Monica, off you go. Well, maybe this could be followed up in writing, because I appreciate we might have got muddled here so we can get that clarified in writing. But the, the £500 million that relates <laughs> to the bus priority measures, is government still committed to that investment? And when will we see measures delivered? If there's no time to get into that, we can well, get that in writing. I think it might be helpful if I, if I write to okay. the committee. I'll write to the committee as a whole on the, the bus funding issues. I didn't want to kill all the conversation, <laughs> but thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> Um, Apologies, Kavir, I should have said that. <laughs> there, will be, there will be a chance to get back at you, I'm sure, Minister. On that note, I want to bring in uh, Mark, who had some questions on buses. Um, I, I think actually all my questions were pretty much answered in terms of franchising and municipalisation. Um, I did want to just go on to a final question, Kavina, if that's OK. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I've got some questions from... I've got a question from Ben and from Douglas. So if, it, if it's... Uh, Ben's been waiting quite patiently. Yep. If, if it's non-related to bus, I'd rather come to Ben Douglas and then you, if I may. So, Ben. I've asked my question, Convener. Uh, there was another one I thought you had. Oh, yes, you have asked it on pavement parking. So, Douglas, it's up to you. Thank you, Convener. You, Minister, you mentioned the A9 in your um, introduction, but you never actually mentioned the, the A96 that um, has obviously been emitted from the programme for government. The, the PNJ calls that a, a betrayal. To the, to the North East. They're right, aren't they? Uh, no, and the uh, A96 was in the programme for government if you want to reread it, and I'm happy to, to, to send it to you. Um, I'm sorry you obviously um, didn't get your, your question. I think you had a question last week in the Chamber on the A96, which you'll have received a written response from, and unfortunately the President Officer didn't have time, uh, I think, for both of us to, mm -hmm. to, to have the question and answer. Um, so in terms of uh, the work on the A96, there is 
the, the ongoing review. The review, uh, the first stage of that was published in December. Um, my understanding was that there was a, a session in February where um, I think it was facilitated by Gillian Martin, MSP, and it had the review group and uh, the minister and North and North East MSPs were invited to that and the next steps were laid out for them. I think the challenge for the A96 was the sheer number of different um, options that were put forward. There were 11,000 um, options put forward. So in terms of the, what I think you're probably interested in is when that's going to report. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously, you know, as, as you probably allude to, it should have reported before now, but it couldn't because of the sheer number of options that have had to go through. And in terms of the appraisals of those 11,000 um, options, we're looking at um, producing that appraisal, particularly of the 16 retained options, in order that that report can, that you're expecting yeah. um, can, can be produced. Because back in 2011, you know, it was a Scottish Government commitment, commitment that it would be fully dual between Inverness and Aberdeen by, by 2030. Is that still on the table? Well, the commitments are in the programme for government. Um, it is a priority for the Scottish Government to deliver on the review, to look at the assessments there, to make sure that we have the improvements. And currently, our proposal is to dual the A96, with the priority being in a separate section, is the uh, Inverness to Nairn, which is more advanced than the other, um, the other work, as you'll be well aware mm. of. But, but is it doable to fully dual by 2030, well, as was the Scottish Government commitment? Well, I think the sensible thing is to see what the review says in terms of um, the assessments of the options, because clearly whatever options are then recommended will have an impact in terms of the timescale for production of that, as will um, the capital availability for that. And as the member knows, um, in terms of, and it's not, I'm not just referring to A96, I'm referring to all of the transport budgets, you'll know that we're seeing a 7% reduction in the capital funding um, of the Scottish Government over the coming years because there was no inflation proofing to the capital funding. And also, you'll be quite aware that construction inflation has been in excess of, even of, of, of regular inflation. So there are challenges for all construction. Yeah. So I think it would be ris remiss of me to give you um, a commitment as timescales until we've done the necessary piece of work, and that will be reported um, uh it was more, Minister, there is a commitment, but it's obviously, um, well, it doesn't appear to be being met. And you'll understand why I'm asking the questions. Last Thursday, the road was closed in both directions near Huntley, another serious accident. And an FOI that just came out uh, just yesterday showed that in the last four years, there's been 11 fatalities on the A96 between Inverness and, and Aberdeen and 82 serious injuries. And I think as it gets delayed even more, you know, we're letting families down that are being seriously impacted by, by what's happening on this road. And that is the reason why I'm pushing it. And that's why I'm trying to get the answer, is 2030 still a commitment? And that's not a commitment you seem to be able to honour at this I, time. I, I, all, you're asking about the timescale for the review that will indicate what the your review options say, what is the best way to do this, how to make sure that, that, is, uh, that the improvements that are made are the best improvements to make sure the, the safety issues are addressed. I think you're absolutely right to, to focus on that. I think that's a really Im important area for attention. But I'm not going to preempt what I get in terms of that review options. And clearly, we want to, to meet timescales that have previously been committed to. But I think if you want to look at what the First Minister has said in his programme for government, in the written published programme for government, you'll see that A A A96 is recognised as the priority that it is. But the commitment by 2030 doesn't seem to well, be a commitment that's there just now. You're, you're, you're talking about your timescales that were in 2011 coming out you know, of, of a period that is 12 years ago. Um, I understand that all governments need to be held accountable. This government has been in power for a considerable amount of time. Um, we have had focus on a number of major transport um, areas. The, the review has taken place. It's very detailed, considerable responses by the public. We can't ignore that in terms of our work. So that's why it will be done um, diligently and appropriately. And you will, again, uh, receive that um, as soon as that assessment has been done. And those stages, the stag appraisals of that initial appraisal, the preliminary option appraisal, the detailed options appraisal and post appraisal all have to take place to progress this work. And that's exactly what I would expect. I, I understand that, Minister, yeah. and that's why I'm saying that 2030 
it's completely unrealistic now because well, you, of the, the delays that well, this government you can, caused. You, I, I, I know you've got constituency interests. this. I know how important it is to you, but I'm not going to engage in, in different opinions. You might want to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm, I'm, in I'm fairness, open, you, trying to be you, open and honest, you know, that's the, uh, um, And I think, uh, in fairness, you've had a good crack at getting an answer on that. You, you've got an undertaking for review, not for Julie by 2030, and that's about as far as I think you're going to get uh, to this stage. Mark, you wanted to come in on a question, I think. Yes, I, I did, actually. And um, I mean, the Minister would have noticed in, in Wales on Sunday they had their uh, national uh, rollout of 20 mile an hour. The default speed limit went from 30 to 20. And there's been a lot of work that Welsh councils have been doing to get prepared for that. I wanted to ask about the, the Butte House Agreement commitment to see all appropriate roads in Scotland switch to 20 mile an hour by 2025 and just what progress councils are making here in, in the rollout of 20 mile an hour to save lives and make our communities safer, friendly places to live. So again, this is a, a policy that absolutely requires the, you know, the cooperation and enthusiasm and deployment of, of local councils in doing this. Um, we're doing it in a slightly different way from Wales. I mean, Wales was everything all at once. Um, and I actually spoke to the Welsh uh, Minister Lee Waters about their launch just last week. Um, I think there's different views and opinions as whether that will be the most effective way. At least everyone will know about it because it's a national um, all at once um, rollout in Scotland. Uh, it's been uh, more of a phased uh, approach and part of that is to make sure that the appropriate roads are being designated. In Wales it's by exception, so it's 20 miles per unless there's an exception. In Scotland there's been far more, I think, consideration by, by local councils as to which roads should be 20. Um, Highland Council are being a pathfinder in this and are already rolling out 20 miles per hour. We know the arguments and obviously that's why I think the, the member had put forward his private members bill was in terms of the, again, a safety issue in terms of lives save, saved, etc. And, and injuries um, averted. Uh, in terms of that rollout, that's already um, started in, in many years, and I know um, many councils are, all, are drawing up their lists of where that is, but they're working with communities as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, because um, the, where, where we've had 20 miles per hour um, areas in the past, some of them seem to be appropriate, but some actually cause more difficulties. So I think that kind of considered view um, is, is really important. So they are being rolled out by local councils, um, and the commitment is still there, and, and they're, they're working on that. And again, um, I'm, I've been pleased to hear that local councils are, are pretty enthusiastic about some of these changes they want to see happening. People have got a different view of their towns now than they've had in the past. I think that was probably one of the experiences of the pandemic. People liked and did and had to, in a sense, use their towns and walk around more, you know, more often than they've previously done. And uh, being able to do so... Uh, in, in a way that's a bit safer. We talked about the pavement parking yeah. earlier on. I think this is similar um, yeah. area as well. So it's, it, it looks as if it's on track, but it's yeah. not necessarily my gift. But it is one where I'll be, again, in probably my regular discussions with uh, Council McGregor and Council Leeds and also Regional Transport uh, Partnerships to see yeah. how it's going. But so far, uh, it looks from Highland that that's progressing and progressing yeah. well. Yeah. Thank you. Transport Bill said it had to be done by local councils, not by central government. Yeah. So that was the way it was agreed by the Parliament in the last session, I think I'm correct in saying. Sorry, Jackie, you want to come in? Yeah, it was a supplementary to Douglas Lumsden's question. I was just going to ask uh, for your view. Um, roundabout, uh, it was regarding the timescales um, for the A96. Um, I was just going to ask, round about 20 years ago, uh, Murray Council voted against the Elgin Bypass. Um, and would that have, have an impact on the timescales now? Well, I don't go back 20 years, but the member might. I'm oh, I sure. do. <laughs> and she might be able to inform the, the, the committee on that. Look, there are key areas that need, and certainly the bypassing, we are, are absolutely acutely um, aware over a long period of time. I think that would have been disappointing if they knocked that back at that point. Well, but, you know, that's time passed. I've got to deal with my entry now, computer, you know, and I've got to deal with what's in front of me. Um, and I will try and be as, as, I'll try and share as much as I can when I can. But I don't want to give you information that I then have to come back and say that's incorrect. So if, if, if you're not getting all the detail you want, um, I'll give my commitment to try and follow up things in writing where, where required. OK, I'm just looking around to see if there's any more questions. Well, just before you think it's all over, Minister, 
Uh, I want to go back to ferries uh, because I want to clarify what the actual uh, committee report said uh, for absolute clarity as far as the direct award um, of the uh, contract was, was it, it was on the recommendation that it is acceptable to communities and there are no legal barriers. That was the caveat in the report. And Angus Campbell, who was on the community board, said it's not acceptable to communities. So how are you going to square that circle with well, less than 16 months to go? Uh, part of that is, is engaging with Angus Campbell and the community's board as to what their expectations are. Um, I have met with them since they produced their report and had discussions, well, what is it they actually want? And what they really want is improvements in the management of, of CalMAC and, at senior level. Um, and I think they've been absolutely clear uh, as to what that requirement is. I think the, the, your second point about um, the second condition within the, the committee is also really important because there are unintended and consequences of making certain decisions and so they have to be robust which I think is what the committee was also indicating so um, it's difficult because on the one hand you've got the committee saying one thing and then you've got the committee's board saying another and I'm left with the decision to, to try and navigate between them um, and that's why the advice from the committee is really important but it's not the only advice which I think the committee itself recognised. Okay. So Sorry, just so I understand this. So the, if the community board gets the uh, board of CalMAC replaced, they're happy to recommend a I, direct award of contract. Is I'm that what not, you're saying? I'm not going to speak on behalf of the community board. They are perfectly capable of speaking themselves. That's not what um, that I'm, I've, I've raised or discussed with them. OK, and uh, just also, just when you were talking about, if I could say about the uh, rearrangement of the structure with Transport Scotland, at CalMAC uh, and CMAL, uh, the report uh, recommendation by this committee, just uh, just as a matter of fact, recommend, uh, reflected the recommendation of the REC committee report. So that's two committees that said it. And, and whilst that some people may hold out against it, I think it's quite clear that two committees in two different sessions of this parliament have, have recommended mm -hmm. those changes. So unless there's any other questions, uh, Douglas, you're not coming in on the A96, so is that uh, OK? No, Douglas. <laughs> thank you, uh, Convener. It is brief. It's just on the fair, fair review. I wish it would change its name. Um, I believe there is a travel companion for blind person's card for buses, but not rail. Is that something that would be looked at again by the government? So when I listed the number of issues that there's individual issues there's a sort of general approach which i think the strategic approach which i think is really key and then there's individual issues that have been raised and travel issues for rail was some one that i identified earlier in my contribution i said say that was one of the issues that i know people have concerns of because it does happen in some modes but rail was the the concern that had been raised and i have replied to a number of um msps um saying that that would be considered as part of the fairs fair review okay thank you Thanks, Camino. And it really is all over now, uh, Minister. Thank you very much for giving evidence to the committee this morning. And I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting uh, to allow you to leave and for us to prepare for the next part of it. Committee members, back in five, please. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Our next item of business is consideration of a Type 1 consent notification for the e retained EU Law Revocation and Reform Act 2023 Revocation and Sunset Disapplication Regulations, I think, Regulations 2023. This is a proposed UK statutory instrument where the UK Government is seeking the Scottish Government's consent to legislate in an area of devolved confidence. On the 5th of September, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Net Zero and Just Trans physician notify the committee of the UKSI. The committee's role is to decide whether it agrees with the Scottish Government's proposal to consent to the UK Government making these regulations within devolved competence and in the manner that the UK Government has indicated to the Scottish Government. If members are contempt for the for consent to be given, the committee will write to the Scottish Government accordingly. In writing to the Scottish uh, Government, we have to, an option to propose questions or ask to be kept up to date on relevant developments. Um, so, uh, my question, I guess, is are there any uh, views from members? And I would just, before we do that, remind uh, committee members that uh, we have written to the Scottish and UK governments on relation to this uh, and responses that were asked within a reasonable time frame, which I believe expires uh, tomorrow. So, if there are any questions or comments, I'm very happy to take them. Mark. Yeah, that, that's a helpful piece of information, Convener. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm content to uh, agree with the Scottish Government's recommendation here. However, I was a bit alarmed by the letter which we received from the Cabinet Secretary, particularly around the uh, National Air Pollution Control Programme legislation, the laws around that, which are not included in this measure to retain EU law. And I think the Cabinet Secretary said that this is a last opportunity to seek preservation of the air quality provisions through UK, UKSI and by choosing to omit these air quality provisions, uh, the UK Government is creating unnecessary uncertainty while it develops replacement proposals. And then she went on to say that although the provisions fall within devolved competence in relation to air quality, it would not be possible to make a preservation SSI in relation to these provisions as they confer functions on the UK Secretary of State, not Scottish Ministers. So. I am, I am really concerned because we are reaching a cliff edge here of 31st of October where the Secretary of State could retain important EU laws that protect human health and protect our environment, yet it looks like these laws are not going to be retained. I mean, clearly the UK Government and indeed the Scottish Government would have the opportunity to work together and bring forward uh, a replacement framework that would help protect our human health and the environment, but there's no sign of that, so, so these laws will go. Um, and of course, it's not just you know parliamentarians that raise these concerns. Environmental Standards Scotland have raised concerns, and NGOs as well. So, I am really concerned about this cliff edge. As we know, air pollution does not respect boundaries; um, it, it crosses boundaries. So, having a UK framework is is important, as it is across Europe. And notwithstanding the fact that this committee has written to both the UK government and the Scottish government. Um, I, I'm, I'm really concerned that, that this law looks like it's set to go on the 31st of October. And we have, at this point today, no, no understanding about what will be brought in uh, to protect our human health and environment in the interim period, for however long that might be. Okay. I'm just looking around the table if there's any other comments. I, I think that the point... Mark is well made. I mean, the fact that the committee has written to both the Scottish Government and the UK Government to ask them for their opinions and what actions are available to them uh, as if, these, if this SI is passed, uh, I think we'll have to consider those letters carefully as a committee at a, at a later date. But the, the Scottish Government is consenting to what the UK Government is doing here, so it's difficult for us to do more than what is uh, in those letters within the time frame. So I think that's the quandary we find ourselves in, and I think the committee just has to understand that we will look at those letters carefully, both from the UK and the Scottish Government, when they come back. And if we want to make recommendations, we can do. But in the meantime, I fear we have little or no option but to agree uh, to the SI. Um, I don't know... Do, do, um, so I would have to move to a substantive question, um, and that is, is the committee content that the provision set out in the notification should be made to the proposed UK statutory instrument? 
I think we are going to have to do that. Thank you. So we'll write to the Scottish Government to that effect. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of a negative instrument, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Ske uh, Scheme Amendment Order 2023. The instrument is a little unusual in that it is a UK instrument and it is laid in all the constituent legislatives legislatures of the UK United Kingdom. Once laid, it is for procedural purposes treated here in the Scottish Parliament as if it were a negatively a negative statutory instrument. This means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul them. No motions to annul them have been laid and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have no uh, comments or observations on the instrument. Does uh, any member have any comments on the, on the instrument? If you don't, I'd invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any further recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? We are agreed, and that concludes our public meeting, and we'll now go into private session.